California was the first state to medically to recognize medical marijuana in 1996. Okay. How many people knew that it was really New Mexico in 1978? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, that's a little bit of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, this is Rob and I in the younger days, in our salad days, as they say. Um, this was taken in 1972, about three years before we started on our path um, in Dr. Marijuana. Um, you can see by the thickness of uh, Robert's devices that even then he was having visual problems. Uh, throughout his life, Robert had visual um, experiences and visual problems, uh, which was always dismissed as ice uh, He was told that, uh, oh, young men, you read too much. But don't read so much, and you won't have ice cream. Um, in, in the 60s and 70s, it was believed that older people get well from it. And Robert as a kid, you know, he didn't qualify. Um, but, you know, he, he had love on him. He was diagnosed with, uh, a few months after his picture was taken. This is Robert at 24 years of age. Um, and um, the, the thing that's important about marijuana as far as its medical effects on this thing, it really is a rocket science. Um, if you're throwing up, Either the kids are doing therapy or they're taking too many drugs or babies or, or, or whatever the reason may be. If you're throwing up and you smoke a marijuana cigarette and you stop throwing up, it works. If you have multiple sclerosis and you're spastic and you smoke a marijuana cigarette and spasms stop, marijuana is therapeutic. Um, with glaucoma, there were visual presentations which you brought up and about white owls, halos, and their lights. Which indicated that his eye pressure was a very was diagnosed. He was around the lights and he uh, smoked a marijuana cigarette a few minutes later, the windows were gone. He called it a singular motion, a singular moment. He put it together immediately with the pattern. He knew <laughs> something that marijuana had. I think he realized mentally that his endocannabinoid system had broken. But we didn't know about endocannabinoid system in 1975, 1974. Uh, Robert Jason did the marijuana decision. He told me I was skeptical. But after a period of time, it became obvious that yes, it did help him. Because he didn't stumble as much. He was more sure of it than he thought. It was simple things. The medical uses of cannabis are not rocket science. And sometimes, if I, I think if I hear that phrase, we well, have just need more research than what we can release this stuff. I think I'm going to throw up, really. Uh, I'm going to do more research. I really am, because I think we have only, we've only scraped the surface on this stuff. Uh, I think there's many more applications that we don't know about that are going to be deliberately exciting in the next few years. And, and I want to take a moment to really congratulate, excuse me, my Margo will be a moment and we can drink water. Um, I, I really want to congratulate the, uh, I realize it's very good to have a better than a long time, but he will soon. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that it builds on some of the state models where caregivers are, where, where patients are allowed to contact with caregivers. Um, and I hope it doesn't go to a route of getting some things in big locations. That, that's all right, too. But, you know, in the last 15 years, the research that has been that has been done by the growers of marijuana in the states where marijuana is the only medical purposes. It is so exciting. Um, and my hat is really off to the individuals, people <coughs> like the, the young men who discovered Charlotte's Lake in Colorado. Um, if we left it up to the federal government, it would be 50 years before we found out that was possible, and then another 25 years before they would um, and these, these young children, uh, they need it now. 
Um, but it's not only the young children that are doing that. It's the glaucoma patients, the AIDS patients, the MS patients, who need to get their assistance. Like my husband did. Um, in 1976, he made uh, New York um, access to marijuana. And it was a huge story. This is the day of three TV channels ABC, NBC, CBS. It was no 24 7 news. There were three channels. He was on all three. He was in every newspaper. I think he was on every radio show in the country. Um, Bob looks good and it's legal. But I think the more telling headline is Bob the Picture. Spotlight on a man who wanted to get 200 years to the building. He was the only individual in America that had a smoke around the community, and it was huge news. Um, he became quite a celebrity, appearing on all the news shows, such as they were that then, um, the talk shows, the evening shows, and Tom Snyder. Uh, he was even on a game show called The Tell the Truth. He was quite a celebrity and quite a novelty. Everyone loved the product to lighten up and blow the smoke. It was a really big deal. Um, but when you asked Robert how he felt about it, he said, Well, I feel like the only one to make a life of it. Um, we knew that, that marijuana was not the best. Um, and we, we need a pack, if you will. I don't know, I should say that that's a big pack. Because we never sat down and thought, Well, we've got to go out and save the world. Just bit by bit by bit by bit. We found ourselves immersed in this issue. Um, and we had to do it because other people needed the same privilege that Robert had. And we needed it. And we wanted it to have it. So in 1977, actually at the normal conference in December of 1977, uh, Robert had a young man's patient by the name of Lynn Pearson in New Mexico. And they became past buddies. And Robert realized that Lynn Pearson had something that Robert and I didn't have. Robert and I lived in the District of Columbia. We did not have a state legislature. Lynn Pearson did. And Bob encouraged Lynn to go home and pass a state law authorizing the medical use of marijuana. Lynn thought that was a good idea. This is in December of 1977. By the end of February 1978, Lynn Pearson Convinced the New Mexico legislature to, to enact a state law authorizing cancer and glaucoma patients the right to receive medical marijuana. And the way the law was constructed, it would have set up a statewide program of research employing federal supplies of marijuana. We were pretty excited about this because even back, way back in those days, Back in 1978, the federal government was still on its one note song. We need more research. We need more research. Okay. Here we had an entire state that was willing to set up a research program to provide data to the federal government. And we knew what the outcome was. We had no doubt about that. It, wasn't, it, never, it never crossed our mind that we could go any further through it. We are your honor way. By the end of the year, there were three other states that had enacted the same kind of law. By the end of 1979, there were 20 states that had enacted the same New Mexico model law. 20 states in 1979 all wanting to get federal supplies of marijuana to help their individual citizens cope with the ravages of the United Think about that. 1979. There were states willing to do the research. Now, what kind of cooperation do you think they got from the government? Not much. Yeah, but a little less than zero. Um, so, we entered the Reagan years. By the end of 1980, there were sort of four states. The pressure continues to build. The federal government is. Well, let's be specific. The DEA, NIDA, and FDA are free to work. We have 34 states that want access to the supplies of the How many heard about the 
in the late 70s and early 80s. It was a neat trip. Um, but I, I have to say that that was, that was the government's first strike against it. They could have, you know, they had all of these states coming to the goodwill. Uh, it was really uh, well intended um, <coughs> individuals with a wonderful result of the lines of the citizens. And the federal government really back on the states and said, no, the federal wants the states get the one well released this is probably probably the randomly absorbed <coughs> application for our step. Strike one against the federal government. We move forward in time. Oh, really important time. <laughs> yes. Um, and I have to get through, I have a little time here, so I have to get through a lot of things rather quickly. But back, fast forward to the late 1980s. How many people know about Judge Young's decision in the 19, late 1980s? <laughs> Judge Young was the administrative law judge of the, the chief administrative law judge of the Drug Enforcement Administration. And in the late 1980s, there were periods, two years of periods before Francis Young, on the matter of whether marijuana should be considered. Uh, Bob and I were very involved in those hearings. We managed to get a law firm by the name of Stephanie Johnson to assist in the hearings. Um, Stephanie Johnson provided years of common assistance to Bob. And to the Alliance for Cannabis Therapeutics, which was through the bottom of my town. And they were instrumental uh, in these late 1980s hearings. <laughs> judge Francis Young, Chief Administrative Law Judge of the EA, ruled in 1988 that marijuana should be reset. This is history, folks. This is what you got to know about. Because you're going to be in meetings and offices with legislators, and you know, they're going to say, well, there's no evidence. Well, there wasn't enough evidence for Francis Young, the chief administrative law judge of the DEA. There was enough evidence for him. There was enough research for him. Now, what do you think they did with Judge Young's decision? Well, they rejected it. Uh, and they not only rejected it, um, they rejected it in a very mean spirit, right? They did it again. John Long, that's very mean did. And they rejected it saying anybody who supports the um, medical use of marijuana is not the one that's state of the That's a direct quote. <laughs> okay. He called his chief administrative law judge a state of the I mean, come on. Strike two against the federal government. They could have at this point said, okay, Chief Administrative Law Judge has ruled. We are going to reset it. DA becomes. Uh, we want to get together with our fellow agencies, NIDA, FDA, and we want to make a plan for going forward where apparently is going to be a state. They did not do that. Strike two against the federal government. So we move into the 90s. And AIDS becomes available or becomes uh, on the scene. And throughout the 1980s, we have been hearing from AIDS patients who reported that marijuana was very helpful, not only for the nausea and vomiting, but also just for the sense of well being. Uh, and also, marijuana gives you the munchies, so they say. And for, uh, for an AIDS patient, the munchies give their life support. Um, Steve Bloom became the first individual, first individual raised with <laughs> access to federal supplies and compassion dining program, which is uh, another part of our history that um, is very important to know about. Um, I won't go into details about how to establish it for a short of time, but um, it, it did allow individuals to gain legal access to marijuana. Steve is one of the only guys I'm sure that he received his, his legal marijuana. But Bob wrote a, he must have put on a um, obituary for um, High Times Magazine. And, and that obituary was, um, was read by um, a young couple in Panama City Beach, many of our kids, who also had AIDS, getting to be a peculiar part of the candidate to 
Um, they were aggressive, they were four plants in the Midwest State Beach area. Um, and on the day they were out of jail, they stopped by a head shop and picked up the Highlands Nancy and saw the obituary from about Steve Luke, the day they were on the Highlands. And it was like a message in a bottle that floated out across the ethers and landed up in Panama City Beach, where Kenny and Barbara Chase, um, two not particularly well educated, um, but really salt of the earth met people, um, read about Steve, and over a period, over a period of time, they decided um, that they would take up the banner where Steve had got it. And we worked with Penny Barber for about 15 months. They were wonderful individuals. Um, with them, we uh, established the Marijuana AIDS Research Service. Now, the Marijuana AIDS Research Service was designed to allow anyone with AIDS who had a dog or a really to prescribe their own. It provided them with a packet of all the government forms that had to be filled out and then the person who gave the legal access to marijuana to the government. Government, by the way, is very fond of saying, all the time I tell you, if you need legal marijuana, you can get it. Just come to us to the milk and you're going to. And what do you mean? We'll give you legal marijuana. Well, that can, um, you know what that is. But. So we decided that AIDS gave us an opportunity because the symptomology is so similar to the AIDS patient, the AIDS patient, the AIDS, AIDS patient, we can create a, um, you know, what you call it, a, uh, you know, do it yourself, IND process. Um, we created a packet that went to doctors. The doctors could complete it in about 45 minutes. If they had a moderately intelligent patient, they could fill out the indication before they got to the doctor's office, the doctor could do it in about 10 minutes. And we launched uh, this program in February 1991. <laughs> and it became huge. Um, at, a, at the Alliance for Cannabis Therapeutics, we sent out over a thousand companies. And we know that eight organizations across the country were zero on that and, and, and giving it out to their patients. We had no idea how many eight IND packets ended up back in the day. But we know that we're a because of the reaction that the Food and Drug Administration provided. We knew that the MARS, the Marijuana AIDS Research Service, was going to do one of two things. It was either going to crack open the federal government and have them man up and say, yes, this drug is really helping AIDS patients, and we need to do what we can to help them. We didn't think they'd go that way. The other way that we knew it could or it would go is that it would shut down the program almost entirely because the demand would be so great. And that is the direction we went. And FDA, DEA, and I, the evil triumvirate, um, really began to freak out. And their fear and their concerns were fueled by a man by the name of James Mason, who was chief of public health service at the time. And as big a homophobe as you would ever want to know in your And, you know, I don't like to criticize people publicly, but I will make an exception to, for James Mason because, honestly, folks, this man, he was not a good man. He said things like, if AIDS patients get their own they will practice unsafe sex. And that is very good. Can you imagine? In the last decade of the 20th century, we had a public official who could say that. He was mean spirited. And for, for reasons I will never know, he could say that. I mean, that, that was music to the ears of DEA. DEA has never recovered from the mean spiritedness of its founder, Harry Ellison. Okay. But NIDA and, the, and FDA, I mean, these people are not minds. They're hearing from the AIDS patients. They're hearing from the families. I, I, don't, I don't know how they speak at night. I really don't. 
the, the, the ultimate answer was that the compassion and I program. That was in 1992. Little significant things happened here in San Francisco. The first citywide voter initiative authorized the governments of Belmont is passed in 90, November 1991. <laughs> important milestone. 1992, we had no companion systems since the start of the program. But the Compassion IMD program was shut down in 1992. Um, at the time, there were at least 30 AIDS patients that had their IMDs with them. Uh, they were promised supplies, but they never had. And there were 15 patients that were already receiving medical supplies in the uh, They were grandfathered. Um, hundreds of IMDs for sure were just simply trash. Um, the James unfortunately died. Now, the reaction uh, to closing of the IMD program was very simply put anger across the country. The federal government vastly underestimated one, the education and sophistication of the American people, and two, the anger that was for the closing of this only legal means by which seriously, seriously ill people can obtain their own. Editorials, uh, news shows, the anger is It was huge. Again, very useful. Third strike against the federal government. And what happened? Well, they got posted on their own guitar because the voters were so angry that they started passing state laws. In California and Arizona, that's my husband, he died in June 2001. Um, in California and Arizona, now I believe there are 21 states across the District of Columbia that recognize the other one. But the federal government has struck out, as far as I'm concerned, three strikes are not. They're, they are out of this. They are out of this. But there's a 900 pounds of people in this because they have a lot of power. A lot of power. And as I said in the beginning, we're kind of in very peaceful time as far as the administration goes. But don't underestimate the federal government. We can get another administration that is not nearly as friendly, that encourages DEA to go after dispensaries, applications. And while I'm very pleased to hear that a lot is happening here in Missouri, I hope we should well and apply it more. We have to keep educating ourselves, we have to keep educating the public, um, and we have to keep reminding them of what Sanjay Gupta said. We have been terribly and systematically misled for 70 years. Gupta's entry into the medical marijuana industry was a watershed moment. He was a man of tremendous stature, coming out and saying, I don't mind to you. And, you know, I wish him long health. <laughs> and I hope that he continues to promote medical use of marijuana because there's such exciting things happening. Such exciting things. Um, I wish all of you well. I hope that Missouri is soon the 22nd or 3rd state with a medical marijuana law. But more than that, I hope that somebody bans out in the medical marijuana law and says enough is enough. We have got to reschedule this marijuana into schedule two. We have got to remove the onus that is placed upon people who are just trying to make their way through the world and who happen to be crippled with a, an illness or a condition. How would you like to see the old being active? Oh, I have a I don't think it needs to be, though. It's simply an administrative matter of keeping marijuana in the state, too. Uh, marijuana, which is what WIMTHC will not become, 
not a crime anywhere in the law. And, and that, was, I mean, that was the argument to us. To, to, to me, standing here, 22 states with laws um, uh, recognizing medical needs for the doctors in those states signing certificates of needs is an accepted medical needs. Um, it's not rocket science. <laughs> <It's laughs> Yes, that, that was our argument, and that was the argument that we just wanted to accept. Uh, did you have questions? Yes, yes. Uh, what do you think is the alternative to the COVID or the summer kind of property material? To the best of my knowledge, Maribel is a few weeks ago. I don't really get into any natural products. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. Wasn't it, isn't it different between Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 that on Schedule 2 you are not prohibited, you are allowed to investigate scientifically and do uh, the, the real statistical uh, scientific approach to it? It's, it's, it's far easier to get research done on Schedule 2 drugs. That's what I was trying to do. One more question. So we've been talking we've talked about obviously about the uh, synthetic you know cannabinoids and delta and DHC uh technique talks on side effects of both the extracts and GW pharmaceuticals. Well yeah, the GW pharmaceutical side effects is um, pretty effective. Um, we had a good friend in the UK and he's one of the first recipients of side effects, which is very effective for And it is it is following the whole plant. Uh, Dr. Guy, I think this is a good one. Where did my organizer go? Well, my organizer left, so I just said, well, um, many years ago, we attended, I came across a number of um, research markets, uh, which um, documented fairly specified studies. On the use of marijuana for young people. And the conclusion of what it was that it was very beneficial. It was very beneficial. But I don't know exactly what the that was, what the problem 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 was, what the United Monographs that were sent to Congress beginning at the year 1973, uh, and every year they're pulled forward. Um, in 1971, it was the first discovery that the, the marijuana lowered the impact of our eye pressure. And the, the, the researcher, Dr. Kepler of UCLA, wrote to the Journal of American Medical Association and said that they noticed this phenomenon. Um, uh, all the way to physiological research, and it should be applied to our patients. Um, and then, the net, he was under contract with NIDA. So, from that point forward, the NIDA monographs always included the results of Dr. Hagman's research. Um, the, and there was a Dr. Merritt um, in the, this is that would be the late 70s and the 80s, he did some research on Dr. Um, that was. Uh, the researchers out there, the argument is that there is a need for research and that there is no research is so robust. And that's why it's important to learn your history, know what you're talking about. It's all about well where you have the emotional, the power of emotional attitude that this is wrong and you need to change it. But you've got to back it up because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Pouring out for 70 years, it misled Dr. Sunday. So you've got to know how to do it. You've got to do your stuff. Thank you. 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 I'm going to
interested in purchasing tickets for the Grand Crew, those can be purchased right at the table outside, just sit, uh, let them know. And also, well, while we're doing here, we also have um, hemp snacks. You want to talk a little about that, Ethan? Yeah, these hemp snacks are from uh, Main Squeeze Natural Foods Organic Cafe down the street. Uh, they're awesome, and uh, uh, we're, uh, I think, two for a dollar, so I can come around and uh, afterwards we'll be out on the table. And uh, the fundraiser uh, got a uh, number of gift certificates and uh, prizes and for the uh, auction item from various Columbia and uh, Kansas City and St. Louis businesses. So uh, there you go. Yeah, that's right. He just had a great job of having just wonderful auction items. Yes, sir? I read that that's a fine item dress. What is the dress? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a great dress. that we are going to be having a raffle before we leave here to go to the Grand Crew. And Adam over there is walking around. We have a uh, eight bait little handheld vaporizer that we're going to be auctioning on or raffling up. So if you're interested, we're going to be having tickets at the end. And we got not too many, so it's looking like good chances you can get it for pretty cheap. And it's a dollar per ticket and five dollars for six tickets. And so Adam's walking around there, and we're going to have this back up at the table up front if you guys are interested. Who donated that? Excuse me? Who donated that? I believe that was donated by Dream Smoke Shop in Columbia. There are a lot of great and very good stuff on the auction tonight. I want to thank all of you for watching our community. I want to thank you for watching our community. I want to thank you for watching our community. I want to thank you for watching our community. I want to thank you for watching our community. I want to thank you for watching our community. I want to thank you for watching our community. If Tim, we're ready at this point, I want to bring on our financial panelists on the community. I want to be set. Uh, Dr. Dave Wilson Smith uh, is a physician who practices for Big Health here in the state of California. He has the opportunity to work with Dr. Michelle Campus as an expert for many years to date. Dr. Wilson Smith has also been a very active citizen uh, since joining the Street of Luton County uh, in Missouri. He's a member of the Board of the Missouri Civil Association. Uh, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him here this afternoon to speak with us. Uh, I have a privilege to recommend a magnetic camera to his case. Please recommend, please have a lovely time. Dr. David, I'll just say. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me up for a while? Yes. I have a very low voice. Sorry. Anyway, let's see this other situation. I'm going to talk to you about the fact that 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 the fact the the I had a case with the Alcoma, we did marijuana for many, many years with the Alcoma control. And that was, it was nice to hear this, but I didn't know what the status was going to be I had patients with anti-cerebral palsy, they were coming off the test, but then we would have smoking, but the palsy got back there, and we were also able to see much more intelligent work. 
Yeah, I've been able to talk some of these people for a long time. And these people have not become cognitive way for me. And they came uh, in 92 and 93. And I was in the private practice in the office in California. And up uh, there, the Starbucks were all really practicing for about two years. The Starbucks had a little northeast, about 55 miles up into the Canadian uh, National House. And that is the Triangle. Does anybody know the Triangle? What is it? Oh, it's the Trinity Chasta in Humboldt County. Not Jasper. Not Jasper? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Anyway, so I had to go to the Royal House in the Trinity House up in the... Well, it was the highest rate of marijuana production in the United States, just like that. Right. Anyway, when I was up there, we ended up person started to take care of people with that kind of sleep and do that much. And as a matter of fact, it was the first year that I was out in private practice with that kind of sleep that was an act. This is something that was important to have the entire United States for all the people that have not been diagnosed. Everybody used to think that the military people were in Vietnam. Anyway, there can be some sort of a medication brought up in the this is the time And the history of that kind of sheet is you get it, and you get it in the center for the And at the end of that time, you get all the way to the professional. And 5% of all the people who have sheet, you get primary other cancer, and when you treat it for that, it is also Well, as far as what has happened over the years, 
Now, at first, when you can look back to China and uh, India, they were using marijuana for the three main things. Now, one of them is the typical childbirth, and also to, uh, to reduce contractions, to get miscarriage, and to prevent those part of this We People also use the natural gas on the catalogs. That was a different use. In 1937, was the uh, marijuana tax that came into the end, and the prohibition came into the end, and all of a sudden, we got in several years of our process. The, uh, right now, the medical thing is that we find that it is something that does respond to different uh, varieties of marijuana. Not if you're dominant pregnancy, safe. Chemotherapy for HIV, Hep C, and cancers, it's safe for those. And when I was up in the Britain's World Health Fund, we were getting to respect a lot of the medical trauma and the medicines that we could come up with the treatment of Hep C. Almost everybody that started with medicine had it down. And we're getting that in. We got called up the world to work. We started to get in the hands of the pot, the very good approach to it, and the pot had to be Now, also, the point of the waste was in there, when we lost the trade losses and stuff, but it's very difficult to do this with that too. There it is. I used to work right now medically, and I had a very positive experience. Listen, in the 
20th century, he said there was a lot of cancer uh, issues with his stroke at that time. And the attack and the follow up was can you describe the difference between smoking and cannabis versus tobacco? There's one less harmful business. Okay, let me ask you a second one first. There is no quantification chart. You know, it's going to be a lot more interesting than five. So, we have a few people who have made this study, and they have studied it, and they have made it, and they have talked about it. And it is not really covered up with this one. For people that have smoked hot and cigarettes, there seems to be about the same amount of money. In the 19th century, it was a small No, it was metabolic. It was It's a metabolic. And besides using those on service, the fact that you can match them up and you can get them bread. There were over 100 uses for it, and it should be used for all sorts of so I did it up before I had to go to the bathroom and focus on the body. And everything is broken. All sorts of things were fabulous. And I went to hell. And I kind of kind of kind of pushed this a little bit and talking to people. But here we go. All the scary things in Missouri. And then all the time we did that for the rest. And then they were just going to Yes, sir. You said they won't fess up. What do you mean, who's they and what do you mean by fess up? I mean, no, I'm going to get to the other hand of the Simpsons and Black and White and this group. They show me somehow. And then they said to them, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with them? Are they intimidating? They're the same thing. Now, it's pretty sad. It's in the part of a lot of us that have the same issue of truth. The ignorance of the women who are in the world. Yes, sir. Have you seen the Dr. Ashton study? Have you seen a lot of these reports from last year? No. He found not only that heavy usage of smoke and cannabis not only did it lead to increased risks of lung and neck cancer, but actually a small reduced risk. And the thing about it is that it was a long term study. Yeah, he's got to have several studies. He's got to have people in the study before they really are about it. But the statistics and even the negative way that they might want to do it, which is one of the best. Yes, sir. 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 What do you mean? Well, what they're giving the ticket to the cattle now, in my opinion, is not a game. I didn't know anybody who was doing that. I didn't know what they were talking about. I didn't know what they were talking about. But, you know, remember, you know, 10 to 16 feet tall. The way I want to talk about it, you know, 10 to 16 feet tall. And, you know, it means almost no water. It holds the ground. And it means basically a little bit. As far as marijuana itself, that needs to be measured a lot more. I just had a conference here two or three years ago, and there were a bunch of different rooms and places to go, and I do believe that they are going to see a plan to see what you find. I am not sure. This is definitely. Then they can see that I can see it. Well, it's a bit of a gamble. 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 Are there different strains of hemp also in each one of them? There are many, many subspecies. So, subspecies, yes, subspecies are different types. They're not all the types. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.
and it, it is just has to have to that So I would ask that you all, in addition to going after these trade centers, which are much more interesting, and we are staying here in Boston right now, but I know those guys just brought people in Boston to be able to talk to. You. I think the Missouri Senate is trying to have some of the things they can't just bring this down. But when you've got the federal government that's refusing to let people deposit money in from their stores in Colorado, for example, that have security firms to guard these tens of thousands of cash. I mean, I see the second one is a lot of cash in the country to talk about because they can't use credit there. And, and that only tells you how powerful this lobby that we are dealing with is. And I had no idea until I started researching. The penal colonies, several months ago, they have my son. They, they have our son. They have our son in the direction of corporation of America. They've had it for nine months. Our son was in a real bad car accident. He, 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 he nearly died. He was very angry about that. He was a marijuana. That was to Brazil and quarter ounce to the north. Went on drug streets. To the doctor, ended up on oxycontin, ended up on heroin, ended up in bed, ended up in jail because he got his heroin for his oxycontin for the doctor and got swept in on a conspiracy charge. Because he has a previous four rounds of conviction, he's in that he strikes for out, you know, seven, ten years. He is a drug addict. I was in jail with 22 drug addicts. <laughs> I met Jesus in the world. It is a medical problem. The 22 women that I was in jail with, I met Jesus there and I had to leave them in there. I, I thought when I got out of jail, it would taste better and the air would feel better, but knowing the women that I left behind that are in there, one of them for 15 months without seeing the light of day, waiting, sentencing on that day of the enemy charges of a small amount. These are drug addicts. These are women who do anything for rehab centers. And our Dr. Jacobson is getting ready to go. The Missouri Drug Task Force has another $3 million to continue their Nazi like SWAT team raids across the state and continue to lock up credits. I hold the governor for a few months. Half a million dollars bail for two counts of sales that she wasn't even involved in. I, I, they have no Half a million dollars bail. We let them go to jail. She's 81 pounds, five feet tall, swept up in a dozen and a half months ago. And she's still there for five weeks and seven months. The only reason I'm out is because this lady right here let me hold on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The only reason we're out is
will have autism. Three years ago, one in a hundred. Two years ago, one in a hundred. Last year, one in sixty-eight. We run that math down to progression forward. We have three years. Period. Period. We're, we're still fighting for the way this is good for us to go. When it might be able to cure diseases that we have no cure for. Children's research. Children mostly can start researching this drug immediately, immediately for autism. We've got some serious issues here, folks. We've got to be American. We're too afraid to do that. We're going to be down here. Our mental health issues are not. We've got to help them. We've got to get asked a lot about people to turn this in. I just say, oh, we've got to get a start in this research on this day to make sure it's like holding this order and holding the personality disorder. The difference from my husband Harold, who might have been talking about him a few days ago, doesn't know the problem. It is $110 for the best of these slides. What I would like to say to the best of Jennifer's on the House Bill 151 is to not put my husband out, to not put my communications out. Edibles are not like. Edibles stay with you a long time, right? And edibles will shock the infection in the car. I know edibles will make you want to throw up, and you know, it's not that way you like. So I would pray that you go ahead and do that. Who's the senator that's so involved in the world of the world? I'm Senator Yeah, and there's, and you know, he should be on board. My husband, he's one of those little things.
seven months later, we got a computer virus. Um, and the, uh, the computer repair shop turned them all over to the computer to use a common address passport, which is a multi-pack, multi-county stroke passport for the green Christian name. Um, in Southwest of our um, four days, we've been out of the four days after the second, second final, which is when they did a small range of conferences. We were pretty lucky. He wasn't able to jail with him, but they couldn't take care of him. He spent four hours, and I spent 22 hours in jail. I mean, as far as, you know, the big one. I'm forty seven minutes, but you know, we spent three days having all the news. Uh, May twentieth, two thousand ten, we woke up. Second class, I referred to the classes, and May twenty first, we woke up the second classes. And the results from that were here in the middle of the town. People on disability. It took me three and a half years to find a job. And even now, I mean, through a tech agency, and I've been working in the same place for nine months, but I'm still there. I got hired three different times, just to kind of have a common base and that offer. You can touch on the dead check on that call that she was a manager of the business. Don't bother to look at that. She might do the business, but not probably embarrassed. Is the guy trying to do this is not the she's she's so involved, she's qualified for the job and it's not like it's happening. But you know a lot of times we get asked why are you just a member, why do you want to do this higher utilization? And I say because I'm moving a lot of times there for me. Even if you have a living with side of the we can do what you need to care about and do it and can destroy your life. The way that it's treated in the criminal justice system isn't going to help. Prohibition does not work. No charge is what it is. Prohibition, I mean, my name is Prohibition, does not work. And I'm going to be in the game with that. Gee, that was kind of ran over a lot of my little speech that I did. I want to try to get some of my speech if I can apply to it. And, uh, it's, it's just a shame to me that they charge. I can't understand how they charge for one day a week when she never stepped foot in my program. Had no, she had no idea to the extent I had gotten it to. It, it, was just, it was amazing. It is even that we here is going to touch on uh, some of the other aspects of our race. We look back on it now and it becomes extremely obvious. As being a business owner, and my business was a business residence. It's not kind of a main drag, but it's also a house, too. Um, it, it's just a weird scenario. But uh, during the raid, it became very evident that they didn't care about the marijuana. They wanted to know where the 30,000 cash was. So, because they figured if I had that much, I had to be selling it in supply of they threatened to ruin and destroy everything, every possession I had, and they were going to tear the place apart until they got the specific amount of cash that they had in their heart sent off. Um, after I don't know how long it was, because I was pretty medicated at the time, they finally did realize that I wasn't selling it, and they didn't know how to. Uh, cover that or present that to the public. So basically what they did is they can use that word of a legend in the story that Trish was saying how we did run on the news there, the main story for three days, uh, that my entire business was a front. As a front that we didn't sell any playgrounds, even though I had 355,000 sales and it installed over 650. In southwest Missouri, that my, my whole business was a front. We didn't sell playgrounds, like we just sold pop kids over the town. 
you can bring up the, the news articles on the bottom of the brand that day. Um, the sheriff where I live, and I'm, I'm free to say this now, it's an extreme media for um, He had to be on the front of everything, and even the stories that don't even relate to our county is typically agreed to my sheriff as a white you want to come and go and interview you with that. Because he has something to say about a little bit of everything around there, whether it has to deal with his county, his citizen, or not. But uh, I want to go into some. I'm a, pretty much I've become a, a patient of rights advocate since I, I got in trouble and I started researching. I try to help patients as much as I can on the science of what's happening in the, in the research part. Right now, I was wishing Dr. Bill could be here today. His, uh, he's been going into this quite thoroughly along with me. He can dig into it deeper because he's got the context. But I uh, urge you all to go and follow Professor Guillermo Valesco of the Complutense University of the Degree. Uh, he's a scientist there who's actually able to do studies on cannabis. He is the one who did the study with the mice and cured cancer in the mice with cannabis, but they can't, re they can't replicate it in humans at this point. So what, what is happening is they're finding out, you know, the cannabis for a long time, THC is the compound that has the most potent anti-cancer activity. CBD helps. They've tried a lot of combinations of THC and CBD because it's good for avoiding the side effects of the therapy. Definitely the THC is important. But what they're finding out is there's this entourage effect. Okay, you got it? Um, you can't typically, I mean, you can't have one without the other, but you can aggravate your symptoms. You can not or not help yourself whatsoever. So what they're learning is that there's a certain ratios depending upon your illness that you need medical cannabis for that you want to have your CBD to THC ratio in the cannabis you're consuming that's going to help your illness. And they're finding that this ratio works best when it's around 5 to 1. Uh, you guys can go on to bfly.com and I urge you to listen to this podcast with this scientist talking about this. It is completely, it is totally amazing. Uh, and I've been getting a lot of my information from Europe right now because that's in Israel because that's where they're actually able to do scientific studies. The studies that they've done here in the US and that I are doing are extremely restrictive and they typically have 20 to 40 patients and you can't get a good can't get a good uh, telling on whether anything's working or not on that, that few of people. Um, so that's a question. I want to touch on the epilepsy part. There's 20 types of epilepsy, 40, there's over 40 types of seizures. There are 11 forms of epilepsy that can be found in children. Uh, I'm, happy, I'm really happy to see them working on this CBD measure here in the Senate. It does need some slight tweaking because it is going to help some patients, but unfortunately, they will not be able to grow a Charlotte's Red under the way this, this CBD bill is proposed. Because Charlotte's Red typically has between a half percent to one percent THC content with a between 10 to 17 percent uh, CBD, de depending on the batch. Charlotte's Web, they're growing, even if you mimic the same growth situations, every batch is going to come out the same. You're going to have slight uh, fair varieties of it. But uh, I got this little list that cannabis can help, and I'm on a roll for it. Yeah, <laughs> um, This doesn't cover everything, but it covers a lot of it. Acute gastritis, Alzheimer's, ALS, uh, angel medicine, arthritis. <laughs> Asperger's, ADD, chronic back pain, bipolar disorder, bulimia, cancer, cerebral aneurysms, CMT disease, colitis, Crohn's, cystic fibrosis, Gehrig's disease, diabetes, 
Brevet syndrome, hysteria, ED, Ehlers Demos, endometriosis, Fetty syndrome, Frederick's ataxia, glaucoma, hemophilia A, herpes, hypercephalus, hyperventilation, incontinence, insomnia, irritable bowel syndrome, liver disease, Lyme disease, Marfan syndrome, MD, uh, Meniere's disease, migraines, MS, muscle spasms, nausea, neurodegenerative disease, neuropathy, NPS, osteogenesis imperfecta, pancreatic cancer, panic attacks, peptic ulcers, post polio syndrome, RLS, schizophrenia, scoliosis, shingles, Sorenson syndrome, spinal bifida, syringomelia, testicular cancer, thoracic outlet syndrome, hypotensive uh, syndrome, Tourette's, Parkinson's white syndrome, anorexia, now asthma, and autism, and alcohol, bronchitis, CFS, colitis, MRSA, depression, diarrhea, dystonia, emphysema, fibromyalgia, Graves disease, HIV, AIDS, hypertension, lupus, pancreatitis, PTSD, prostate cancer, and if there's anything I left out, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, also, you guys, I want to let you know that since my preview, I, I really wish I never made my preview. I did not know now what I knew then when I got the trial. Uh, I just would have gone to trial. In my county, there's been, in the last year or month, my county has 80,000 people in it. There's been 11, over 1,100 felony cases processed in my county. But only five of them have gone to trial. And three of those, the people were found not guilty. So they, have, they try to figure everything out. They don't have a really good track record. And if they keep up on the case, they're processing felons. My whole county is going to be felons here. I'm going to start with Christian County, now by Francis. Just to be the whole reason Yeah. Uh, this is what I want to say. I have to finish with. I am not a criminal, no matter what label the prohibition is put on me. There are thousands more like me here in Missouri than not more. There are millions in the U.S. that use cannabis. Cannabis for whichever reason they choose. Cannabis being legal is not stopping most of us from using it. Do we really think the government can stop millions of people from doing something? And what is supposed to be the method of three? Please, tax and regulate cannabis that has never come anymore. Prohibition of the war on drugs is still too many and needs to stop. It is still more than anyone. Thank you. Dr. Colorado and Chiefs, who is a professor at English at the University of Missouri at Columbia. Uh, she is a theorist, a film producer, a film writer. She's the author of the book on Marathon and Motion, and also this book, Until the Famous uh, Influence Story of the Young Man who was murdered viciously down in Mississippi. She's been interviewed by her books of the American Columbia Prose Library. She's also a co author of so many books. First book about the Nobel Award winning author, uh, and she is passionate about the ability of him to access and access an antioxidant. So please welcome Dr. Conroy.
This is interesting. There's one site it's called um, A, it's called G, no, it's BG, by the way. BG12, like what you're going to say, ProTan.com. And you will see Dunny Collins being introduced by Dr. Phil. And I saw this last spring, Dr. Phil. So this is being working on. You know, I mean, I know you're not a sick person, you never know it, but wow, you're just going to be all over the place. I mean, you were dead slice right here when you were seeing I was here. You were dead slice right out of the end. What are you doing? You got to stick with me. Yeah, right. This is what happened. Well, Tampa gives you energy in addition to all these other things that it works towards, okay? So, we're talking about a man who says, I found the closest thing to. Um, it sounds like you, and I'm like, hello, because if you really have this the Bible, for example, Genesis 6, verse 3, it talks about uh, uh, God gives us uh, 120 years. Excuse me, he does not mean blind people to pray. Because if you blind people to pray, you probably do need to move on to God now. Okay, 120 years of good life, good living, and the channel is in that you get to the first. My students, a lot of people are really quite shocked and that's so I am 68 years old, okay? Yes, I do. Maybe I'm going to go to the next But the bottom line is that I am a very powerful person. And I have a little bit of time. That's what we do. 68 and nobody's 69 at all, okay? I can hardly sit the entire time of this. Oh, I've heard of all that. So, these are some of the diseases that can work against many black heart diseases, uh, sugar diabetes, uh, strokes, and heart attacks. Um, we talk about kidney ailment, cancer, you know, arthritis, all of these things, you know, some of them got immediate results, okay? And I'm saying, we need to do this. We need to look at this. We need to go to abcsciencereport.com and see the video for yourself. And then you need to find it for yourself. I wrote a lot of those in the years. The main thing I want to remember is that it's literally gone for a million and a half per second. It works on the cellular level. It's anti aging. That you have people like, in addition to Dr. Field, you have the Dan Rowland from today's show. Uh, you'll see them talking about the panel. You will see uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Michael Williams, who was really, really, really good at being able to get at still with uh, his problems and his problems. So, this is not the chance for seven years. We want to write a book for a great book. It's not what we want to do. But that, uh, basically, um, you're talking about um, we as a people need to be about the business of sharing things. I have a very good friend, Michael Matthews, who won the Arsenal of Rain Man. He called me up and told me he lost a lot of money in the process of Canada. I said, Yeah, that's the second line of the year of that. Hold up, you have this for me. So I took a minute out to tell him about him. I said, If you mess up, I'm going to die for you. He's removed. Tell you why I'm not calling you. I'm like, Good. Last fall, we called him. He said, We just got to have time to start. She didn't hear it all. And she was a good friend of all. She actually found it behind my mom, multi baby. He said, Man, I'm tired. He was good to go. And I'm like, Hold my breath because I wanted to scream at him. He said, That's not the way for her. I told him. Okay? Once you tell a person something, the other is no longer around you. We have a responsibility to so keep her and to speak to that. To add this to our list, we know and we heard many, many testimonies about the other one. And we don't buy into an idea that this is just a man. We, we know that, right? Because we listen, we're trying to, to listen to ourselves, right? Here is yet another thing that you might want to consider. Go online, abcsciencereport.com. Look at the video, look at the mind, look at the institution. Uh, this is the this is the five plus years. This is what they find out. Go to bg 12potential.com See what you like. And if you agree, then you can just sign up. You can call me anytime. 
I think that will probably be like, well, not this guy. Who's the guy? Down on those numbers. Okay, not just off the numbers. Down on those numbers. Down on those numbers. Down on those numbers. And I can give you a specific suggestion. How do you sign up? That one is the man who wants to get that benefit and save the $10. Call me and let's talk about it. You have a responsibility. I'm giving it to you. Just like you just shared with me, I'm so glad to have that uh, introduced to this this morning. I don't know what I have on the last year. But here I am here, and I will introduce to you some wonderful information that I've heard of you. That's going to make me look into the deep, right? But I want you to do the same thing with the family. Go into it and find out what you can find out to help your friends and your family and your colleagues and people that you don't even know. But you might need to first hand. You can be sorry for them because you see them together. You want that to stop. We're not supposed to be dirty. We're not supposed to be able to be able to be able to be Is that wonderful? They find themselves able to be able to That's why we got some people who are in their 30s and 40s, like the 80s and 90s. And some people who are 80s and 90s and 100s, high degree of education. But still, where to still wear the music and then we will last. Okay, so we can be uh, we can be great and strong, and we need to make sure that we share that very selfish we can get the best and not share it. That's all I want to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Three. We appreciate you being to this afternoon. We're now going to have an actual panel of the uh, law uh, of the law and the law of 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 the law very effective opponents of marijuana reform, but the league has turned that around, and the members of law enforcement against prohibition, and in particular, the black are some of the most effective opponents of marijuana reform. So, please welcome Chief Larry Kerber. Uh, the battle is, is not a problem. The nest is being told, 
these slides that you can do that digitally. Uh, that's one thing that gets to the end of the earlier presentation. The CNN correspondent spoke was there, reminded me a lot about that. I've been involved for 20 years, and I feel like now this past year, I realized that I've been situated in the same body as the guys. Only because that's what I was told. You know, as a child, I was told to marijuana that you go on to kill people and rape them and abuse them. And I really believe this guy, I felt the same way. And uh, in my heart, I think it was a marijuana field in the middle of Mississippi where uh, I had a marijuana plant set on. And I got pictures of the first marijuana group that I found out that it was a picture of some new kids that I was just doing handy work for them. These were side times because I was still at that was helping me. And now, all the years later, I think about how good they are. I was able to make the extra third people and I did what I was. So now, it's in the time of my career, but it's time to set the world and start to make the violence of these problems. So I've been beginning to make a lot of problems for me. And probably in just this last few months, I really decided that I was also going to be very outspoken. Because most people, Get your information and you move to the city. I'm amazed at how much of their information comes to me. There are no other drivers, uh, people who are running addiction clinics, or no other fellow law enforcement um, So I felt that it became my part of this effort, if nothing else, to diminish the lies and mess that we have all out of law enforcement. Start saying that they did the stats for hearing our truth. The effects that you're telling me that this is going to happen, and you nothing know, else at least accounts for that out. Um, so I'm thankful for John for taking a few minutes to speak to me that day at uh, the CPAC conference. He's a game involved, and I'm thankful for Neil and his to get involved. And at that time, I met a group like the rest of the trees. You know, Springfield was the story of what they had to go through and opening their eyes to truly what their laws are about. It's confiscating the money. It's truly not stopping the road trade. Uh, one thing that just a couple weeks ago, and some of you may know that from being on the first campus page or the campus page, um, I was at a national education conference in uh, North Fulton, Tennessee, South Carolina, uh, Nashville. At that conference, there was 1,000 police officers, 1,000 in one setting, that their main job was the interdiction of uh, drugs and money on the highways. And these are probably some of the top. Innovation officers in the nation, not in the These guys have seen millions of dollars, thousands and thousands of pounds of every kind of work in the nation. But there were two things that were said at the conference that day that we saw over there um, that really addressed the issue. One thing about the uh, Facebook page, which I know this is one thing I asked for, they're all going to be sure from a normal perspective over in Springfield. So I'm going to go to Springfield to the conference the next day. And a friend of mine actually captured the one. So I'll just look at this and some of them are like, hey, maybe you guys really support that and look at it kind of guy. Because some of us all kind of work in front of this joke. I'm like, no, I'm just really supporting this. So they can kind of confuse some of them. But I have a few of these officers from Colorado, these officers from Seattle as well. Um, but in that conference, they talked about Mexican cartels. And this is one thing that I think is greatly said. If for no other reason, if I arrest somebody for you know, marathon, I'm taking this to town to jail. You drive past, you know, two, three, four, and that's the hardest thing. And you think about it, we are imprisoning people for picking a box that the government just has a divorce. Because you have an alcohol, you have tobacco, and everything. And we're still worried about somebody who's going to take the marathon. And we're not worried about all the people coming to take the three drugs that are without a child.
the higher level, maybe the first person is the second person. You can rise to the higher level, and the other person is the This person did no harm to anyone else. They possessed a joy. So what? The person began to be alive, and was seen everybody's life as they drive by, and let's take a look at the job, and the person who was trying to do something wrong. So again, to me, this isn't just a issue of changing values, it's an issue of being for our laws and standards. Um, but at the conference, we made a really broad difference. We were so worried about terrorism. I heard a portion of the MTV that says, two girls talking, and how about I buy from them? How about their purses? And the one girl was like, yeah, I have a friend that's not buying from their purses. So I'm losing purses. I'm made up of seats for people, and that money goes back to terrorists. So if you buy these these bags, you're just going to kill it. So put my hand out of it, you should have these. You're, you're going to support the terrorists. So at the same time, though, we were all three or four happy to allow the next two years to be we continue sold in this country as you want. And where does that money go back to? The next thing you want to buy it. There's three things. You ever just buy these? I don't know if you can talk to me. A lot of times, they're doing our products in the industry. Street gangs get their start by selling the cheapest drug that they can, which is Mexican. Once they build up enough profit from that, they move on to their top of the team, heroin, all that else. The initial start, a lot of money, but this is not like selling it digitally. You know why? It's cheap. This is a gift. Go try it out. So, Mexican drug market helps us see all the shootings and killings along Mexico. Who's funding that? You know, you're going to go. Not just American people that are buying, but the American government, we are allowed to have that Why don't we shut that down and allow Americans to go here, buy it here, and support the entire industry that's no different than that? So, what do we do? We do
some of the marks that we have spread and we made to go on. It's a weird thing we had this in this year. And with us today is another law enforcement officer. And just as me, I don't know what to say at the law, I'm kind of saying to myself as well. Myself and the sergeant do not speak with any of our cities. We do not city tables. We do not have a lot of our other parts. But I've been with this officer for 20 years, which I think is a long time. It feels like a long time. The area's been in now for 30 or it's very long. So right about the time I was eight, we became a police officer. Just a lot of So people did not take us seriously. But we also did some other things besides educating 
uh, education medicine. People were coming down and we were able to talk about this issue, and they saw that it had some importance to their constituents. And I think we were able to advance that further. Because of that, this year, um, we, we received hearings on the, uh, uh, the medical marijuana, which got passed out by a six month vote, and that was a huge victory for us. We also had a hearing about industrial hemp. Um, that was just passed out, that was, that, that was passed out. That's a huge thing for us. I mean, we went from trying to get a hearing to these are and now they've been passed out. And now that means they will be discussed in the house. And I want to talk a little bit too about our CD bill. Um, something that is a reaction from our other bills for uh, picking up the men down there. Uh, the leadership of the house wants to get a bill. And that too now that was passed out in the house. And that's the vote on the people on the local floor of the house. What's that? Why that is so important is because we were able to identify because we were there and we were able to identify who suggests us. And maybe not as far as something that definitely identified as an assist. And so now we have legislators who are on record voting for and showing and support the bill. So I call that a big bill. They now have a So that is a big deal for us now. It's a big problem for you guys. And now they now, hey, you know what? They can go up and set up a point and do it. They can say, I love this. So I think that's very important for us. So we keep moving, we keep moving the ball further and further until we get there. You know, I have to tell a little story when I was at the Police Arts Association. We have no parents in the city. It was the police officers who lived wherever they want. So we have to move in the city of San Diego because the school was there. And it took us seven years to do that. So this is this is there's a long game about in there. There's just a chart, chart between them, but this is a long game about. So uh, we're having a great legislative session there this year. And now I think our expectations are really higher. We want these not just to be heard in the meeting and pass out today, we want this voted on and we want to sign that vote. And I think we have the potential to do that this year. It will be difficult, and I assure you we're going to guarantee but we are getting closer and closer each year to do that. Um, I want to talk a little bit too about um, this. This is an interesting break. Yeah. It, it's just like we, we went to visit the state legislator, we brought in some constituents, and she did it time. She said, hey, um, these bills are going to be very rigid, it will take 20 years before you ever able to pass them out if you keep pushing that. And then she went on to say that you know, right now the, the people in the legislature are all conservative Democrats and they won't want to go or they will never let this happen. And now, but I guess we passed it out a week later. This is what she said about my race. But she said, you know, you don't want to go out and let us see it, legalize marijuana. And he's a hard part conservative and all this kind of stuff he said. And this is one of the tenets of the Tea Party. And that is, they do not believe that the federal government should tell us what we do here in the story. <laughs> and that's the only thing that we're trying to do with her health. And we did it in fact, cast that out. And that is huge for us that we do that. And you know, um, a couple other things with the Tea Party uh, beliefs that I'm going to take off for a year. Um, the Tea Party beliefs in Martin Craig's pretty nice. Well, the hemp bill is exactly that. We want people to be able to grow what they want to grow and be able to sell it wherever or whenever the market will bear. We're not looking for subsidies, we're looking for what it will bear. So the Tea Party is very supportive of the hemp bill. I know Tea Party is probably not totally in support of legalization, but I believe they are in support of the hemp bill because of the free, uh, free market that is business. Another thing is fiscal responsibility with the Tea Parties. Uh, I believe it was uh, something like 240 million when we had our proposition, but it was estimated by uh, our slide on what that will bring into the state of trade offers and what it will say to law enforcement in the back. Uh, of course, you know, how much time do I have? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Well, you know, it's almost as long as I'll give you a clap. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> The other thing is the, uh, 
physical care, physical responsibility, everything is. Now we hear things like uh, states' rights. Well, let me explain something. That's just a term people use. States do not have rights, only individuals have rights. What we have is states for So what you see out here, like people like Brian Evans and other folks who believe in the design issues we should work very well. Same with this. They believe that it's the states of Florida to do this. So a lot of times people like to brand it as state rights. They try to be used to that. When in fact that is not true, it's states of Florida. So that pretty much gives you the Conservative take part in the type of name on this issue. And I think that's why we are conservative in our The second, the third thing I want to address is from the law enforcement aspect. As a police officer, um, and I've made hundreds of marijuana arrests and thousands of drug arrests, um, after 34 years, I realized that this is not getting much effect on your society. Um, Certain things are driving the fact that this office is now making more of us than ever when it comes to marijuana. When I first came on the police park, I was in a, I was in a place that probably most people don't know was uh, in St. Louis, uh, drug infested, high crime area. If you came in with a marijuana arrest, uh, the other police would be next to that, which would be fine. Because we knew we had bigger problems out there than people would see marijuana. So they kind of, kind of, Foreign to the needs that the young policeman is like, hey, we have other priorities. This is what police work is about. This work is about priorities. And then it's getting the important criminals and whatnot off the street and the important crimes out there. <laughs> marijuana is not another. Uh, the time and file, when you make a marijuana arrest, you have to make an arrest, you have to convey that person to the station. You have to take that drug to the lab, you have to have the drug analyzed, you have to convey that person from the station to the headquarters, you have to do all this, not in the county police report. So you have to, and then we start talking about lawyers and courts and all this about. And we are talking a lot of costs. It is not fiscally responsible to do this. I always tell this, this little story for some of the people who are tired of hearing it come to all the speeches. Um, but this, this relates to priorities. Uh, when I was in the third district of patrolman, we did a lot of uh, crack deals on the street, street crime deals. We had a number of crack dealers who were shooting them. They're, who they were selling dope to, they were ripping them off to get the money. We had a number of those going on. So I was attached to the street corner apprehension team. What that is is you go in, you buy the court order money, um, as soon as the sale came, you still get a request. So we did this through a, uh, a number of locations in the third district. And so many people coming up and trying to sell marijuana to our undercover. We didn't we did tell those guys to be. Sometimes we would call the undercover and say, hey, come in and let this go here out. We're trying to make a book of this. And they're trying to put the dope and they're in the freaking stuff. So we can come in and park guys in and tell them to do it. So that way we can come in and pick up the back. This is going on a lot because we want to make our cocaine arrest and find out who's going to shoot. So eventually, we'll replace all the air and we'll have it. We'll have it. We'll have it. But uh, we had a drug dealer who comes up, and this is the words he says to our buyer, the uh, undercover police officer. He says, hey, don't make me shoot you. Like I had to shoot that guy on the street. And so it was fine, he was drug transaction. He still then he sees me uh, as I come up on Mars, but he knows me very well. He tries to keep money, but he knows his money that comes to the Mars. Money's very difficult. I don't think I ever tried to do it here, but it's very difficult. So he sees the money, I have to get the money out, he sees the money. And then I put the money under the rest of the sale chart. And then I also realized that he was under arrest for murder and passing all his rights. He was stunned because he was getting arrested and being taken. He was being taken and recorded that he just shot somebody in his So what happened was to get back to the station. He then tells us who did the murder that he was describing. He told us where the gun was, he told us everything about this. 
we were able to clean up that murder. And the reason we were able to clean up that murder is because we weren't wasting our time with the so many people in their own office. We were able to focus on what we were hired to do and what was going on in the South and the state of the province, not the people in their own office. And this is what it took up our time. So this is what I tell people about fire rights. And then, um, you know what, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, S4 for TRL, I need to talk about that. Um, I will talk about this real quickly. Um, the way these arrests go on, especially in the city schools, uh, we talk about the rate of incarceration. Even though use of on marijuana is about 50% white, I think those numbers are pretty even. I think it's very close. A place like St. Louis is 50% white, 50% black. Yet in the, across the country, the numbers are probably close to for each, for each white who's arrested in marijuana, there are four blacks who are arrested in marijuana. Across the state of Missouri, it's 2.5 to 1. In the state of St. Louis, wherever, it's 18.4 to 1. Now, people can, people can criticize the police, which they do, but I really think that's the the situation you're put in, things have changed. But now that you think about that stop using, where you're put into high crime areas, uh, and other areas. And so what are you going to do? You're going to take the easy arrest. You're going to let somebody in a bench warrant in this court, and you're going to let somebody with a marijuana. And in the books, it's like baseball. It's no different from a home run in the same. It's a little thing they don't care. And that's what happens with these kinds of arrests. It's an arrest. And this is what they're looking for. Um, uh, we have no talent in our songs. We'll help uh, jack those numbers up. Um, uh, we also have our, the, the cameras and the police cars. And I've had this number of people are calling me. Another police can call me and say, hey, what do I do? I've got these two things in front of me. I see if you're on camera. And I tell them, hey, you have to go to You are on camera. Because the police can have an outlaw's head discretion. So when I came on this police department and I get somebody from trying to cause a way, you throw it, throw it, do whatever, tell me what you want. Or you take it, or you take it, and you get home and tell us parents. And they took more, they took it, they took it, they took more action than they did. So that's what police officers at one time had at discretion. They no longer have that discretion. And they have to arrest these people. And I think these things are all the way in the time which actually cause us to make more arrests. And I will wrap this up with one last thing when it comes to the uh, rest. I see people, uh, I see people get burned out, I see people get burned out, I see the little ladies get knocked down the first story. All that is done is for a meth habit, the uh, heroin habit, cocaine habit. No one has to have a little old lady by a heroin habit. We get each other in the neck, and we have to realize it. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak here today, and I'm going to let the team come on there and talk about this. I'm going to hear the words on the phone. I don't know what the team was. 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 Honestly, over the last few years, I've been able to get some panel from parents and they're one. Those are the ones that came as well. You know, again, we're told very little bit about this in the academy. It's bad to go out of the course. You know what you want to say. Uh, and speaking of the work of this year in St. Louis, I was invited to an event. Um, and uh, in St. Louis, the program is called the Good Fellow. And uh, there is a prohibitionist police officer in Missouri at the same time that the black community is all for cheating marijuana on uh, the label, which I find very, very, very valuable. Uh, John was the father of uh, some of the people around here in the community. It's been a very good experience for all. The fourth thing is that it's now that it's not accurate. That's a massive problem. Um, and it was at a African-American survey. And I thought about John. And a year ago, he told me how to speak for legalization of marijuana at a black church in North St. Louis. I thought it was the same. But again, always be looking at the people we're talking to. Religion, uh, parties, brothers. Um, and real quick, they go over the even. One reason why I kind of got this work was to be John and um, so to be Candace did a bit down in the school degree. There was a, I guess, a Facebook post that was made by one of the class officers who did this black community. 
terrific learning to people who have been doing it with some cool way to talk and what else. Really, you can do that. So, whenever I talk to you about that, a lot of people are fully in the place to do it. Doctors, attorneys, city judges, police officers, um, you know, a friend of mine who's a clinical psychologist. I thought, well, that's a good job. And they all have to be pretty high in degrees. So, apparently, that's not the case. So, again, I think this is about to be for those of us that aren't in the series of the world, and this is kind of the balance. Um, and I know we talked about it before, but I think it's a trial. And it makes it possible to get a watch the movie. But uh, even to say, I don't think I'm going to be able to do my own business. So, again, you know, if you're helping someone who's very strong in the logistics, it doesn't hurt to bring it up. For example, with me, my own logistics, my wife's doing logistics, and all that, 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 and all This is kind of the funny part of a lot of these books. Now, you know, one thing I learned at this conference was that these two books came out of Mexico and you would stop all these cars going throughout the United States and living in Mexico and different local black and states and other states on the market. And then they realized that if we catch them all in one way, it works. If we catch them south, then all the way out. They got the money in the back. So you still see a lot more guys who are going to the South Valley State, so the North Valley State, so they're actually going to make money in the South Our next speaker probably has a more immediate face time than the blogs, um, but it has a fantasy look. I think it's getting all the TV shows and YouTube and everything else. But these are the areas with the American Sports Reform Executive Directory. And this recently was a project that took the advisory board for our American. And uh, so you just got to you know, give me a couple of advice to keep in this. Uh, I think I'm sure you are going to get the same thing on the guys who are going to see you and all the work that I've been on the board. So it's such a simple thing. So you can manage it. You know, one of the things I learned during 2010, uh, when the problem with Mr. Mikey was growing up on the top of the table, was that. The two most effective messengers on treating marijuana for the law enforcement and women. And I think it's a very extraordinary thing that here in Missouri, the chairman of the campus has treated half the city law enforcement officers and half the city law enforcement I think it's a big thing. So, this meeting and I found the organization here that was important for the world. Uh, you know, arguably, you know, sometimes not only the late 2009 or early 2010, uh, here at the public reserve. And actually, my interest in the subject is a lot older than that. I was first educated in the as an elementary when I was a sophomore in high school. I was a high school debater, and uh, there was a compelling issue in Missouri at the time. Uh, and the, uh, obviously, I uh, in my faith career. Um, but it was a really difficult topic that I didn't have to come up with call the papers about the subject. And around 2008, 2009, there was uh, that the reforms to the system that happened a decade earlier were completely useless. And that the problem, especially in terms of drug prohibition and where the structure was headed, was much, much bigger. And so that's what kind of catalyzed my. Interest in drug and non profit and doing advocacy on the side. Um, so, around 2010, in this community, um, a lot of us uh, were aware of the Kinlock Marijuana Spotlight. And that was really a critical example for a lot of us in terms of what the drug has become and how that the threat has become as far as privacy or security or literacy in this time. And that was really a great opportunity I had to present the issue of passport in the context of marijuana and drug prohibition. And that was the more of a catalyst for getting a lot of a lot of other things to happen in terms of what I was doing. And uh, I think that's just a wide audience. 
Um, so let me explain some, some uh, basis of the basis of acid forfeiture. Right? There are two, two kinds of acid forfeiture. Uh, I'm okay with one of them, the other one I want them to abolish. The kind of acid forfeiture I want them to abolish is called civil acid forfeiture. This is actually an ancient uh, British era, colonial era, colonial <laughs> era. Uh, under the English kings, they would delegate sheriffs to the courts of the law, so they would typically pay them money. They would give them a sheriff's commission and say, You are now entitled to the, the, the charge of courts of the king's law, and you can also seize property uh, for people who are violated this king's law. Uh, that's basically how you would approach the Congress law. And this became, as you can imagine, a, uh, a way for people to be power and be right to people to. Uh, build their uh, careers and their family uh, using the man called Bach in the form of medieval England. Um, and then when people began to get from their uh, American colonies and settlement there, it became an issue because the king of England wanted to tax American colonists very heavily. And one way they did that was by uh, establishing all these tariffs and taxes on exports. And so people, exports and imports. So um, this was a big issue for legitimate businesses, for the for uh, people who were trying to make a living under you know their sort of kind of caps. And this was an issue that really faced the citizens of Boston. You might recall the uh, piece of people who signed the uh, Declaration of Independence, John Hancock and John Adams. John Adams later became our second president. And, uh, uh, back then, he was an attorney in Boston. He represented a variety of money, including the Boston business in John Hancock. Um, I want to tell you a quick story about this because it's important. But in, uh, in 1768, the king of England seized Mr. Hancock's ship, his head being the Liberty. And he sees the ship and accepts that uh, 9,000 pounds sterling fine on Mr. Hancock about a million dollars of base money. Um, because Mr. Hancock had been accused of, accused of, see, of smuggling in wine and rum from the British Cap. And uh, this investigation was uh, caused by, uh, initiated by a prosecutor with access to a confidential report. And the way that it worked back then is that. Um, you know, the case prosecutor can see his property, uh, pay the editor, the prosecutor's office can get the editor, and can then pay it to the department. So I was about to tell you, you know, what's on the first one? And not so many words, that's exactly what's happening. So the uh, founding father you know, wrote the declaration of independence, wrote the prosecution, wrote the Bill of Rights. They included a lot of protections that were supposed to protect the lives of property and liberty. And some of those protections were taxed away from the Fourth Amendment. So there's protection against unreasonable search and seizures. Some of those protections were articulated in the Fifth Sense. Now, uh, some of those amendments, for example, the right of protection, the right to process, uh, the right uh, on citizens' states to unrequited rights and rights not to the federal government. All of those. Uh, protections that could have in one way or another disturbed or impeded or uh, destroyed by what Congress did in the 1970s and 1980s, which is bring back to the world of law enforcement mechanisms uh, as tools for the war on us. And that's when civil forfeiture comes back. You know, civil forfeiture, again, we, we did, we, we got rid of those things, and we got rid of those things generally in the you know, boundary, and we don't really see the government seizing a lot of property. Um, you know, during the alcohol provision, the government might seize your alcohol stuff. But they didn't have the legal mechanism to do this uh, necessarily in the way that the government could keep the ground. And that's really the big thing that Congress did in the 70s and 80s. And particularly in 1984, uh, uh, Congress did a few things that were incredibly dangerous and have really done a lot to negatively impact our society and the law enforcement. Those two things are Congress gave the federal government civil forfeiture uh, and it passed it not just as an enforcement provision, but as an election mechanism. 
So the board will be made for if you look at the federal government of law enforcement property value, that can be a place to do the work of the federal government. After 1984, the Department of Justice was able to keep that number for its own action. The second thing that Congress did, that was incredibly destructive in 1984, was say that the federal law enforcement could get that money to save the local monitors. And that was another important thing that has really corroded our existence of democratic justice. Um, in 1987, the DEA began pulling in more revenue than its allocated budget. Which is a scary prospect. And in the last 20, 30 years, that revenue stream of civil forfeiture has really crept from the UK and the IRS to basically every federal law enforcement agency. The, the agency of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has asked for forfeiture powers. They're very involved in the agency and they're like, or try to. Uh, Exposed and advocating against the population. And then, you know, the Department of Justice was a major player, was the major player in pushing past the forfeiture laws at the same time. So, uh, you know, in the late 1980s, a lot of states adopted civil forfeiture as enforcement tools. Um, so, what am I saying? In the United States, drug prohibition is an effort that is a great part funded by systems that have the left, the sphere of democratic accountability, of democratic participation, um, and have really, think about it this way. If your government agency does not have to have a legislature, it's not going to have to have a county commission, city council, or state legislature, or even Congress with the budget, what does that tell you about that agency? It tells you that that agency no longer necessarily has to, on a day or a day, day, day or a month or a year, because it's really less much about the legislature that's saying what you care about, or what you care about, because the people who are representing you no longer vote on where this money goes or where it comes from. So, drug law enforcement in this country has really become a uh, experiment in how far the second branch agencies. Can disconnect themselves from this entire representative democratic system that we have under our constitution. The second thing that's really uh, done is um, create a system of perversions that is now long. It's Tony and Gary from the UK. Now we have law enforcement officers who use primary job of individuals not to intercept drugs, it's to intercept money. And those of you who have been victims of spot rates here in this community or around this way, both in the state of that moment, probably in the city of when they come to your house, they're always going to look at the drugs that they put on the rest of the party, but they're really looking for it based on money that they can come to their bank accounts so they can pay their salaries or their pensions. So, in fact, here in Missouri, if you're one of the 27 drug task forces, you're a Narcotics enforcement office for one of those task forces. Your agency is probably funded for a mixture of tax forfeiture revenues and federal defense. And that money goes to pay your union dues for the Missouri Narcotics Officers Association. What does the Missouri Narcotics Officers Association do with their uh, uh, union dues? They hire a lobbyist. What does that lobbyist say? He goes to Jefferson State and he advocates against us. He advocates for continued prohibition. He advocates for uh, standard criminal laws that allow for more possible forfeitures and revenues. And that's a scary process. You know, one of the things I uh, just really want to say, so one of the things that we've worked with the the last couple of years is uh, working with a legal marijuana in the states of Colorado and uh, you know, California. And particularly in California, the problem is extremely horrible. Uh, uh, the California Narcotics Officers Association, one of its largest lobbies, is happening. So if there's a question why the legislature in California hasn't taken take action in the last 20 years to regulate and pass the control marijuana, because there's a extremely powerful police lobby out there acting against, acting with their own special interests. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, quickly tie this all together and then uh, let's go over some panel discussion. But, you know, here in Missouri, uh, 
we have, I think, roughly, uh, I think we have some growth of opportunities to spread all of this to turn all this around, to begin to think about uh, the same line. And that's important because, you know, through federal, uh, because the special, uh, and actually there's no way to be international. So, under federal civil forfeiture, our state laws about how long the person does, or where the money comes from, doesn't really matter. Because now the feds can funnel civil forfeiture around the two hour state laws, around the concern pension is very long. And that's a dangerous thing because that again disconnects law enforcement and say from the sort of legislation from the local governments. You know, with a lot of the lower extent, our drug capitals are not these very law enforcement agencies, or they're federal law enforcement. And that's an important thing to articulate when you're talking to people who care about federal involvement in this area. Why? Because that kind of behavior, that kind of promotion of state authority, of democratic accountability, sets the stage for things like federal run democracy. Sets the stage for things that our control of federal democracy is going to be Missouri that we can't really control. Them. So, um, you know, we have a good chance, I think, in the next session and in the next commission cycle to roll back our own information in this area. And I think we have a good chance at any of the use of forfeiture revenues by law. I think the state constitution here, if you look this up, I'll put my section 7, clearly means that the clear person of any forfeiture reform in the state has to get education. For decades, that hasn't happened. It's not a money pit. That's called a drug law enforcement. It's not fiscally responsible. It's not democratically responsible. You know, it's an active, uh, ongoing assault on our rights to the property, and it has to be. You know, we'd like to see the legislature, not the legislature, and completely abolish the civil forfeiture, and only allows for a forfeiture in the case of criminal conviction. But we might not for the law enforcement. That's going to be a general fund for appropriation. You know, there's already that constitutional appropriation in the of education, but that's the legislature. So um, let me uh, say thank you and let's uh, have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're not only saying law, uh, local law enforcement going to the DEA and intermodal security, but also the ATF. And again, that's something that sets the stage for things like federal gun confiscation in the future. In, in Missouri, uh, what's going to happen in the next uh, update? I'm trying to keep my eye on this moment in the Missouri Process Association. One thing I found out is uh, in the state of Missouri, there's these huge block grants from the federal government. And that's why a lot of these uh, agencies are relying on to destroy the so, Well, there's so many agreements in Missouri that I'll buy in uh, Missouri State of Greece as well as meeting the saw basically. So for now on, if you're an agency that doesn't have this kind of separate other jurisdictions and other agencies part of your unit, you're no longer the agency to the firm. So you're going to see a lot of these smaller agencies now consolidating efforts with other drug units. You're going to see these larger super drug units now coming to the Fed and these programs. The ones that can't, and there's one in the more simple county, that's what to do today, they're going to remain with their river three cities. But to do that, they can't get the grant money anymore. Who's on this? How are they going to fund it? Or for it? So they are going to be the county of the board, any way they can, and this will be used as an idea to get the grant money. So now, what we're 
we spent time with this up here in minutes. Take uh, questions, whether they are questions about more points in this aspect, or things like growth, and technology, and things like that. You can all ask me to and do the Are those about the change Uh, and first of all, if you don't say about your mind, if you see a how much the Chevy, uh, the and the Chevy and the Chevy those are basically the small natural. Um, you can hear a lot of those are different models. You can find a good word to get a new the same thing with these models. Um, but, um, but those are going to be the ones that fall from regular control funds, but they can move the real money into the general budget for purposes. So, that it is possible that they can do that. You see more of these here. Can you just describe uh, further extent of uh, civil forfeiture? What can be taken for what kind of effect? Uh, Exactly, what are they after getting? Yeah, exactly. Um, they were the one who was looking for something to see, they were looking for something that's useful. Again, you can't take the uh, current accounts of pop and turn that into revenue. You want cash, you want to be the most fun, you want to be all the um, Let me give you an example. There's a famous case that has already uh, taken uh, pop, uh, some sort of attention basically. Uh, there's a fellow called up in Massachusetts, in a town called Tuster. The DEA has a special agent whose job is to look for property in court. So look what this guy does is he goes to all the newspaper records looking for arrests for criminal records in Detroit. So he finds you know, that 5, 10, 15 people have arrested at this hotel over the span of about a decade. Then, what, what's his next step? He looks at the property records so that he's going to see that there's no need on it, that there's no outstanding mortgage, because they forfeit it, they assume that they can see that mortgage. Finding that this property is the plot to pay for, it's a million dollar property uh, with no problems, he contacts the local police department and says, We have a federal asset forfeiture. Where and, 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 and there's all kinds of stances of federal, federal laws to make this possible. You know, all that the government really has to do is show a nexus between some kind of criminal act and some kind of problem. And that's, and, and the other thing about civil forfeiture is that it relies on a legal theory that says the thing, the thing the occupant receives as an illegal person that can sue in court. So you get these completely absurd court cases, United States Federal Government Case 176, and several other. United States Federal Government Case 1815, Main Street, on the huge story in Massachusetts, and what um, And then the property owner will complain because this is not a criminal case, this is a civil uh, uh, process. The, the property owner generally has to show that by some standard, the problems with the evidence they show that the property is not guilty of the alleged offense. So, to answer the question of what kind of property can they see, the federal government sees literally that can, you know, that is or isn't the old man, as long as they find that it's financially legal. Uh, now, a good, good follow up on that is that, so, uh, uh, one of my colleagues in Anaheim, uh, California, read the law, signed to the people in Anaheim who rented out their property to the Spencers. And the uh, feds came out of that and said the landowner is responsible for, you know, uh, for, for this Spencer operation is a violation of federal law. So we can take this entire property, we don't have to charge it, we can find them, we can convict anyone, we can just pay them. Um, fortunately, the Institute for Justice one of the national organizations that really does have the resources to defend the property in these uh, cases, uh, stepped up to the act and got the contest in that county, which would make it difficult for property owners and uh, medical industry in California. Um, so, um, there is, and there's all kinds of nuances to the law, we have no kind of property to talk about, but it is an important thing. And ultimately, my goal is that not just to see the action on the state level, but we have to have the action 
get the property stack. Because if we don't get the property stack, uh, there are very few statewide reports that we can really rely on to control our law enforcement and make sure our state authority on uh, criminal matters has been launched. What's interesting uh, on kind of the flip side to this asset forfeiture is that it's actually inhibiting business from possibly earning more revenue on their end. So, I don't know what you're saying here. Um, in, in the industry that I and I have probably in uh, Colorado, where of course it's free. Um, and uh, we have plenty of people who would like to use parts of our facility to grow marijuana and produce marijuana. We'd love to do that. We could charge an increased rate, we could build more revenue for our business. But by doing that, we could open up ourselves to have that property season. You know, that's a good discussion to have. Uh, one of the things why Colorado has been able to move forward without a lot, a terrible lot of federal interference is because under their state law, their marijuana industry is tightly regulated and controlled. And so the Department of Justice has decided it's not necessarily going to the wild to do enforcement because the state is tightly regulated uh, medical or now recreational. The second thing that Colorado has benefited from is a U.S. attorney who I think his priorities are not necessarily uh, marijuana prohibition. And that's an independent idea. The U.S. attorney is appointed in terms of the pleasure of the president, but he can do whatever he wants in terms of discretionary enforcement of the law. So his interest is really in certain other arenas, and I think that's good for the industry. The third and final thing about Colorado, and this was articulated to me um, by uh, a couple of months ago. The law, and maybe Jason can have, uh, I'm sure Mason will have a comment on this later, but uh, someone told me that one of the reasons why I think we were able to suppress this from Colorado is because our law enforcement unions are not that relatively strong. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think about that, Mason, but um, you know, that's a that was an interesting observation. Can they put it in the corporation name to protect themselves? No. Nope. You, know, you know, the U.S. attorney in southern New York, uh, there's a news article floating around in their own place. They like to play a uh, version of 6 3 of separation. Name a celebrity. I'll find you a federal law that he's around. And uh, here's some document, you know, and this this U.S. attorney in Southern New York falls in love with Billy Dollar. Say I don't think it's um, and former LLC. Can they see black out if they come in and see my business? Yes, the California would have seen as they will, uh, you know, they will they will go after all the principles in that dispensary with the drug operation. They find a good financial record that either they'll, they'll have a uh, team around their house, they'll have a team around their drawers, they'll have a team around their storefront. They find take financial records, they'll go to your bank and pull out all the money in your bank. Uh, they'll look at your property records. You know, kind of a free fall in a big sense. The, the asset culture aspect of this, that's not this guy who's going to stop. He's trying to see as the asset culture is being specialized.
that they're funded by the federal government. Yeah. Um, where does where does our legislature come down on the tax rates? I got it. So in uh, in the 1981 budget.
my back door and all are most in this space so the folks should get together to uh, see a lot of that and seeds here and there's a lot of people who participate in these times uh, out in the hallway at Francis and so they end up and there's always many people at that classroom and so I just want to put it watching the band so I can see these things be a little more fun and makes us some celebration and culture. Uh, I think here you go now I call the uh, worst example of the worst law. That is the AC human life without the role of marijuana and criminal offenses. And my just brother Mike came in from Chicago today and uh, he's going to share some of the family perspective of uh, what it's like to have someone get the worst sentence possible. Uh, so I'm going to give them a couple of minutes here to speak. I have a hand out here, but it's sort of laid around, so everybody stop a little bit of uh, some things they can do to help that and to help the movement, and uh, some contact information and resources. So uh, I'll just start this over by going and uh, really appreciate them and the rest of this family that's in the Edmund Robbins Children's Stages with us. My name is Michael Zizansky. I'm not a public speaker, uh, and I'm quite nervous right now. But I can give my daughter's story. And uh, my daughter's story is actually told me. In uh, 1993, my daughter's son was arrested and found guilty for possession of seven pounds of marijuana with intent to distribute a controlled substance. And because it was his third time, he was arrested for an environmental marijuana offense. Here, uh, he was tried as a fire and persistent drug offender. And he had life well below, without the possibility of control. Just first of all, it happened in 1984 when he uh, sold the house of marijuana. To a family member who had so much money from her class. The second offense was for another small one. On his third offense, he was driving a plane and he had arranged to purchase seven pounds of marijuana. His friend later testified in court that Jeff was unaware of his plans and not object. And none of Jeff's marijuana crimes about weapons, violence, or juveniles. But that didn't stop the judge from giving him both of life and of the My brother is, and I was a man, the Japanese construction company when he was free. He taught his sons the trades, he was a carpenter. And also a good work ethic. Jeff would always be you to show up his bed if you needed it. My brother's most. My brother's arrest in the incarceration has not only affected him, but he's affected many others. Jeff's sons were just teenagers when he was arrested. Jeff missed out on the milestones. My husband is a common boy, but he missed them for all the reasons for them. He has missed his own son, get married, and had children. Jeff not only missed the birth and the growth of his grandchildren, but he also missed out on the complete experience of being a grandfather. My brother has not only missed out on the experience of being a father and a grandfather, but an uncle, a brother, and a friend. Jeff has missed every important family event for the last 20 years. He has missed out on every holiday and family event. Jeff was also locked up for the death of our parents. He was never able to say goodbye to his father, to our father, I When our mother was diagnosed with cancer, we made me my mother make a trip from Chicago so she could see him one last time. 
the fact that he was not allowed to be with and take care of his mother when she needed him the most, just killed him. And I want to take the time to thank John Payne, Tony Bettinger, and Amber Livingston, and everyone else who ever helped this case. Thank you very much. You know, you try to make the best of a rough situation, but you know, you know what it's like to be in a room and have to be in room in front of somebody. It's a part of everyday life. You know what it's like to have to bend over naked and watch a jail guard look up your buckle to see if your family or friend or lawyer smuggled some drugs into it. It's not a big thing here, it's a big case. You know, we have to make the best of it. He's got a job there, he's helping mentor younger prisoners who might need more rehabilitation. He does. Jeff would like to put out his thanks to so many cannabis and all the public speaking for a big time out, all the grassroots support, all the people who called the governor, and you know, particular people that have done specific major tasks. And, you know, so that, that's really Jeff's main. Message today is thank you. I guess I want to update everybody so we're a little bit behind on schedule. I'm going to squeeze my hands together pretty quickly here. I'll update everybody on the publicity and the campaigns. I was going to mention there earlier with the big bills on the planet. I'm going to have 70 a lot of attention most recently. And that came about from donations from grassroots supporters. And this reason, money about thank you for all of that. There's a lot of things that happen. You know, we're going to one day for the endeavor of petitions and change that order for 360,000 people in Rachel's life. Signing on the line is a reduced paper or the carrying out of the governor in front of the media and you know, let, let the governor know that it's for all kinds of country. Let's see what else is in my notes. Uh, Oh yeah, so there's an online video of student data and this case is a group of some students got over 64,000 views on YouTube. If you Google that, that's the answer, there's 20,000. Uh, so I uh, guess it comes up, it's really snowball. And this just started since last October, we were issued a little long page report for children and families and got picked up in networks all across the country. And, uh, so it's really snowballed into a big uh, Big campaign. There's Missouri legislators that are sort of dating the ladder and encouraging the ladder to grant funds. There's been a lot going on. Um, another uh, recent event is uh, just a couple of days ago, there so was a TV uh, reporter from Kansas City that uh, had the opportunity to interview Jeff Millhouse, the prosecutor of Jeff's case. And, He's in the middle of the middle of the communicated to you privately and then publicly in the news as he actually supports Jeff's clemency and so far as he thinks he's done a lot of time for the crime. But he's reluctant to express that because uh, I'm not real sure I won't see the letter that he's going to write to the governor. He has been in the case in the email yesterday. He just wrote the letter to the governor. And when he has concerns, he thinks he thinks that uh, Jeff may have. Jeff and some of his supporters may be misrepresenting Jeff's criminal history or his uh, degree in the middle of his crime. You know, we've never tried to argue about guilt or innocence. Uh, this is about to do no matter how guilty he is. 20 years is too much. We like it up all the success. So we're really hopeful for clemency. But ultimately, clemency may not happen. Initiative to get our constitution changed to put in uh, provisions that will release Jeff and other Kansas offenders. And you know, we've heard a lot of very good news today about uh, the bite sized pieces of progress in the legislature and the public eye. That's all great. We hope to get our best solutions, not just for Jeff, but for all Kansas. It's got to come from the voters here in Missouri. So, you know, we really need to keep our I are mobile to figure out how our goals are for that initiative campaign in 2016. Uh, another very interesting thing that happened recently with Jeff is uh, I'm trying to 
help educate people in the real reason we know a lot of health issues start is because of rise in the petrochemical industries every year to go where they saw the potential of cannabis to compete. And I wanted to communicate and tie those issues together with that. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Emperor Rares to Close. And that's got uh, a big online book, some of them for free. I wanted to jump and read this book. So when I called the prison and asked how I could bring a book there, and this guy described the book and he said, well, that would definitely follow the different sentences of policy. And there are a lot of ladies and photographs and there are a lot of words in one way. But if you thought they were hard, they might be okay in their senses. But I thought the work they did all the way that's in our sensitive policy, unless we got the permission of our legal counsel in Jefferson City. Well, I just happened to come from here from law school, and I never seen it in the first place, but it calls to have a friend who can communicate in these ways. And that's plain and her. You told me to go online and look at it. This is my need to know. Side of the time and issues of him and jail time, prison time together. And she finally said, Okay, keep it for one month. He keeps it in his cell and doesn't let any other prisoners. And of course, his own man talks to me. And he's read this book just in the past few days. He's just amazed. He's flabbergasted. You can't believe it. He totally supports the idea of teaching people about that and him. As part of the life when he's there. It's not just the hysteria about THC, that hysteria came about because of corrupt influences. So I encourage you all to look at this book and do that research and look into other. And I mentioned a couple of websites here where I think you can find uncensored research information about them. Because I think there's a lot of activists around the company who realize that some of our things are wrong organization. Funders and campaigns are not going into that issue. And frankly, I'm quite like suspicious about that big money. That's why I don't want to. And I, I, before I became a law student, I did a lot of sociology study here, and I did a lot of studies about the social issues. And I'm aware that, and, you know, I mean, don't think the petroleum industry has gone away. Don't think they're not infiltrating our campaigns or our funding sources. Don't trust anything. Judge for yourself. Speak for yourself. Teach, teach the truth. So the support campaigns and teach the truth. You know, I know there's problems with the initiative of the show of cannabis that I have tried to address in the show of cannabis. And I've been told, don't just be drafted by a committee out in work if some group of people I don't even know if they're drafting the language and they won't even allow us to release the drafts to you yet. When I finally got the grants for these, I saw there was some serious mistakes that didn't apply to state election law. We had to try and remedy that. But I don't think anybody was intentionally trying to scale about the test case. When I started looking into the funders and the people associated with the border that don't have to see the communities, I realized that these funders also were not going to work with the enemy and it is time to open up research into them. And I want to put up a little bit an excerpt from the study here and show you what I'm talking about. Not too good with technology, but uh, these are these are two numbers from the study of uh, you know, the amounts of seeds that were out there first scale major in the summer in the wild tent fields in Illinois in the nineteen seventies. And the meaning of these numbers in this map is that when you extrapolate the numbers of seeds that they found in some of these wild plant patches to the per acre of production, it shows that it's possible to make at least eight times, and perhaps not many more times, seeds per acre than what anybody in the hemp industry knows how to produce now on the low THC strains that are required by law. And our, our environmentalists have something to allow us to do research, but the normal answers would be certified strange below 0.3%. Now, there's a theory that THC is actually like a female hormone that attracts the pollen and you can produce the more seeds. I've been digging with the leading young scientists in America and Canada for research and documenting what the effects of these low THC strains are on seed production. And it appears that that research isn't so readily available. 
So we want to encourage people that grow marijuana, let medical growers or whoever you are, let some of your plants go to the seed. See how many report for this young dot work is collecting the data on this informal research, which is scientists and universities and all our academies are about the seed trends. We want to see how many seeds per acre can really be produced. This is what I did with the farm bill. People like Randy Paul, who supposedly did the parade and free over farm and all this people tea party, he also loaded tax breaks to auto companies. Well, he's gone from this 0.3% in a, in a, uh, research limit as well. I bet we're selling out by a million in our research to one of the PhD strays. We need to involve in our own movement to get the legalization on it. Because it's all the best that I can't hear the same disease and the same plant. We need the research to fill the environment almost as best possible, as if that's true. Might be wrong if the pieces of the puzzle are looking too suspicious to know unanswered. And like I say, I don't know if the movements, infiltrators always come, always try to say it. My theory is oil only comes to have up, legalization is inevitable at this point, and no event is popular enough, it's inevitable too. So their strategy is to sabotage the high PhD research option, and they're infiltrating the Marijuana legalization movements. So my advice is to support the local movements. I know you don't be candidates, I don't want to be slaves to these out of state funders, but it takes money. Money is making these movements happen. So we need to figure out how to make that money locally and from the few rich people who don't have some of the strings attached to put them all out of their money. Yeah. I know I'm going to build a little bit over uh, one or two minutes over uh, where I'm supposed to be in another. Speaker of my materials, and there's lots more than I'd like to say. And uh, I'm going to pass around another thing here. It's a, a book for people that uh, want to sign in, a little contact information, uh, share more reports and uh, information for you. So if you have a pen, you can just write print it up there, or it should be practice for petition gathering. When you go to gather petitions, it's just one of the biggest problems. People are going to hurry and it's really one thing. They don't qualify then for balanced signatures. So right up there and up, and I know how to find you if you want to do that. There are things I want to say just real quick before I let the go. As Dan mentioned, I'm doing this thing for Jeff and Lee. I do most of my legal work here at Lee. I'm a very cool businessman, a very cool supplier. I usually give my clients what they want, even in hard situations. So I don't think it's inappropriate for me to ask you all. comes up, May September, we're going to be uh, doing the raffle. So if anyone wants to buy any more tickets still for the uh, Bay Bay pin, we'll be doing that now. There's about 15 to 20 minutes left before we're actually going to be doing the drawing. And so again, tickets are a dollar per, per ticket or six for five dollars. So if anyone's interested, just raise your hand and I'll come by and get you. And we're going to keep going. Yeah, this raffle is a deal. I'm just going to get a great deal on this big ride for the 12 times of urgency. Take advantage of it. I also encourage you to end the uh, have them all ready to buy your tickets and buy your dinner. We have to highlight this conference in the world's record. We don't want to see them to ride through for excellent.
here on the chance. So we might have a friend and most of us not all speaking, but if you're going to be able to see that too is a great restaurant. Uh, it's a little bit of a scale. You don't have to find anything more about it. You don't have to find anything more about it. You don't have to find anything more about it. You don't have to find anything more about it. You don't have to find anything more about it. Again, yeah, I don't see John in the room. So, and, and I'm not sure there's any purpose with us yet. So, let me know. I'm all the way to fill in. You know, that's what you do on the floor of questions and comments for a few minutes here. I'm not going to ask a question. No, I'm not going to ask a question. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious about it. Do we hold one hand with me? Yes, sir. With an alcohol test, you can test the AC right away. Where is the state of the alcohol test? Well, people are, you know, this is a surprise to a lot of these guys, but there are people being arrested for driving the ambulance in Maryland and prosecuted and all who are being convicted right now. Uh, we don't have the AC in the roadside, you know, now we're here. Uh, but indeed, that may not be a big problem for the girl driving like a 50 mile an hour. That will continue after the legalization takes place. There are still going to be prosecutions for cannabis. Really, and I don't want to spend too much time on this table, but uh, in my opinion, performance has to be what should be in terms of alcohol or cannabis or anything else. Because performance has to be what we're concerned about. No matter whether the impairment is caused by the key, or the cannabis, or alcohol, schizophrenia, or anger, or whatever it is, it is to be able to drive safely. Performance test, I have an coordination, and actually see every officer, I think all of every officer has a fear of the car car. The set second is what we should be doing, and it will measure the impairment by whatever cause. You know, and, and that's, that's the concept that we do. But uh, I think we do that on the speaker now. We have Mr. John Payne here to do it. Please come forward, John. Thank you. I'd like to speak to Mr. John Payne for all persons. And uh, if you're here earlier, you can make a hundred dollars to uh, speak to you about last year. We put it in the engineering on the bill just to reduce the penalties on uh, possession of cannabis. Uh, and we kind of did it here in the last six seconds. And it's been uh, representing the Kirkland's downsizing state government committee. Uh, and you know, we would have gotten that there if he had not gone to the speaker and said, but we, we really at least want to have a discussion about this. Uh, because we can't, we can't really apparently consider an issue unless we're willing to talk about it. Uh, and at the time when most Republicans would just walk the other way uh, across the aisle when we were, when we were walking across Texas City, uh, Representative Kirkland was one of the few representatives who was willing to actually engage the topic and have a fair conversation about it. Uh, and this year, he actually, uh, he also spoke at several more town kind of hall meetings uh, over the last year. He's spoken to Rob, I've been paying for our bill. And he is, uh, has very generous of him because he's constantly traveling across the state speaking for a number of topics. So we really appreciate his time. I think he's just so good to make a lot of this to you. Yeah, so he's a very long process to stay on the line. And this year, he actually took a step of uh, co sponsoring the industrial digital. Which was just voted out of the uh, economic development committee in the past 16 months there. Yep, so uh, you're welcome to the public. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. I could have uh, to be kind of brief, like John said, I traveled across the state all the time and speak on a number of issues all over the place. So uh, this morning I was in St. Louis for a uh, Two hour conference on covering a whole host of issues. Then from here, I actually have to get back to St. Louis and then uh, one more event tomorrow night and back to Jefferson City on Monday. Uh, but as far as the industrial windows goes, uh, what would make the connection back up a little bit? Uh, last year, uh, John came to me with a bill uh, that one of my colleagues had introduced, and they were fighting desperately to get a hearing. And I'm one of those guys that just believe any issue that anybody's going to sponsor in Jefferson City is usually an issue that's probably going to at least bring it before a committee for at least a little bit more discussion, especially one such magnitude, especially some of these particular issues that are going to put some states from Colorado to Washington and really to some states throughout the whole uh, US. 
So last year we didn't get that hearing. The bill actually sent to my hearing committee until about two days before the inset, which gave us just enough time to buy the law and notice it up. We had to go down to 24 hours before it was actually able to actually come to the committee for a discussion. Obviously, since it was on the last day of the session, we couldn't actually have a vote on it. We couldn't send it to the rules committee or to the House of Lords for a vote. Um, we just had been the discussion, having to go forward, where some of my colleagues could actually just talk about it and ask questions. You know, John was there to testify, unless where some of uh, the students were sitting in their So throughout this year, I spoke a little bit. We've actually had a number of bills come forward, um, medical marijuana, uh, some that would involve just extracting oils from the plants, not to be used for other medical purposes. In fact, one of those we actually put on the house floor that just gave a day to get a tax. Oh, I think it might have been 10 to 12 people that were in 13. But you can call them now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, about 50 people voted against that house floor. So, I think that what's happening here is that we're having a much better discussion about something that. Uh, for a long time, it was a really great to talk about. And understandably so, you know, it's kind of a, a hot button issue. But the thing is, is you can't actually move forward on any, any of these issues, either one way or another, until people have enough spine and fortitude to actually talk about the issues. So that's where we are in the DC House right now. I was actually kind of surprised. Um, the sponsor of the Yes of Pence bill, uh, Representative Mike Cullen, uh, he's on the other side of the house for me, but you know, I've, I've got some libertarian leanings on, on a few issues, and so you'll find that people that do actually we meet, you know, regardless of what party you belong to. And I'm beginning to say, hey, uh, all of us on the internet, this is still a hundred and co sponsor. Talked to him a little bit about his bill, uh, felt like it was something that one of the co sponsors, so I put my name on it, and then just put my bill. Uh, the guy who sits right behind me on the house floor was the second post mom that was Gabe McKinney, not Gabe, and he used to be a county sheriff. So it's good, you know, when you've got people from the law enforcement community and from other parts of uh, industry, <laughs> and, uh, legal profession like Michael Lewis from, uh, coming forward and saying, hey, here's a good first approach, here's a good issue that we can at least begin to expand the discussion about, you know, why is it we're so scared to actually talk about marijuana for a for cannabis. Um, so uh, he said, you know, Paul, what would you think about this bill from your committee? And I said, hey, that I'm all for it. My committee, I'm so proud of him. Because all these Democrats, we haven't been afraid to discuss anything, any bill that's come before us so far. We have a very good, open-minded group of legislators who are going to discuss anything. I said, sure, here's my committee. Well, then uh, the chairwoman of the Economic Development Committee said, hey, I would actually like to hear this bill. I told Mike, I said, you know, to bring it to my committee, we'll bring it to the vote. And uh, it's almost like myself and the chairman of right now, we go and start to compete. She said, well, I'll give her a vote. I said, okay, I'm with me. Do you want to hear the bill that bad? It's all fine with me. And so, I, unfortunately, I also sit on the Committee of Economic Development. Uh, we had a lot of uh, good, good discussion, good talk. A lot of good witnesses came forward. Um, it's really fascinating to see people who are open-minded on an issue but they're also trying to be really, really careful. So everybody in the whole community always uh, prefaces their uh, their comments with, "Well, I, I'm I'm talking with law enforcement back home, and I certainly don't want to undermine any of their efforts. I'm sure not for marijuana use, but you know, still, man, I think this is probably the direction that we need to go." So everybody in the community uh, just kind of set up their comments by saying things like that. So I think that what that kind of shows us is we have people who are very sensitive to things like law enforcement, which this should be, right? But also at the same time, they know that there's some things that we, there's some discussion, there's some paths that we just need to begin to take just because it's a good and smart process, especially in you know, things like this. So we had actually, uh, which is kind of rare, we actually had two hearings on the We had one hearing, and it, just, it lasted so long because. One thing, I, one thing about politicians, everyone feels like they constantly have to talk about every single issue. This is such a huge committee, there's like 26 members of this committee, so everyone, I think I might be the only one that actually can talk. Of all people, right? I'm the only one that can say that I'm so happy. So, 25 of my colleagues all got to talk for the whole hearing. They told, they told the kind of committee they're going to spill, everyone would have to say something every single time. Finally, we got to the point, I told the chairman, I said, I think we're ready for a vote. 
So we've had two hearings, everybody's talked on this, everybody seems to agree that this is that industrial end, you know, we have to use this for it, this is a good direction to go. And I take, took some time to talk to the chairwoman outside of the hearing committees, um, just to let her know how to do this. Other than you, I'm not, this is sort of the chair. So I was at the gym, and I was working out, and I was on the rocks, and there's these two, two guys, they're both Hispanic, they're speaking Spanish, and, uh, Kind of being a social person, I just thought I'd try to start a conversation with them and start talking to them. It turns out these two brothers both live in St. Louis, their families are from St. Louis. They own a whole chain of tanning salons in St. Louis. I said, okay, I said, well, so where, where about do you live? You know, my district's in the St. Louis area. They said, well, we don't live in St. Louis. We live out west. We said, we make money from our tanning salon, but the majority of our business is through industrial land. And I said, oh, interesting. <laughs> And so we started talking about that a little bit. I'm telling the chairwoman this whole story. I said, we'd really like to live in Missouri, but we can't. Because it's, our business is actually illegal in our state. So we'd like to be able to employ some of our family members. So, so that's, you know, we got this tanning salon started up, and so they kind of run that. So but we employ way more people on our family farm than we do with our tanning salons. And I thought to myself, economic development, bam, just like that. I mean, right now, Missouri is one of the last states in the nation for GDP because we don't produce a whole lot of things. We make some cars and we make some beer. Then we take the tax dollars, put together the public service houses, and tell you how to use both of those together. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, we need jobs, we need to produce things, we need manufacturing. And this is an economic development bill because it, it's all about one thing that's what I'm doing is economic freedom. The more economic freedom we have, you know, economic prosperity follows the path of least resistance. The more freedom people have in society to operate and get to exercise their own initiative and ingenuity, the much better opportunities we're going to have, economically speaking. So, as far as industrial hemp goes, look at the story, the moral of the story is, is here's two brothers that have the initiative, that have the drive, they want to be prosperous, they want to make money, great, try to make money. But the thing is, is if we make certain things illegal just because of fear or because of similar related issues, right? What we actually do is we actually begin to clamp down on economic freedom and it's really destructive in the economy of our state. So I would like to hopefully run into these two brothers again at some point and let them know, hey, you guys are going to be able to be, move your farm and industry back to Missouri. <laughs> For the people in Missouri to have jobs that other states around the nation who are east and far west have been able to afford some of their people and some of their residents. Uh, right now, we don't have a lot of room in Missouri to be plain uh, choosy with what kind of jobs we do and we don't want. We got a lot of people that are out of work, and uh, for an industry like this, there's obviously a demand. One of the people that I tried to get on the phone, I don't think they're today, I'm not sure, but I know that there's a group in Missouri makes beer. And, uh, you know, being able to rock from a plant like this, I mean, he currently, currently, right now, you can actually, it's not illegal to have possession of the raw material. You're just not allowed to produce the raw material. Right? So you can actually go to Whole Foods, you can actually go to some stores and you can buy a product from you, that's a plant. But it's illegal for you to actually produce that particular raw material. So what we have here is we just have a conflict of issues. And it's, it can be devastating to our economy if we allow this to happen across a whole other spectrum of wrong theories and other things. There's just a lesson to be learned here. Freedom works for our economy. Freedom works. This is an area where we need to have a So <laughs> I'm pretty much almost the end. One person says, There we go. That's not cool. So, yeah, so Republicans and Democrats, at least as far as the industrial use of hemp, they're agreeing and they're seeing the economic value bringing this to our state. And I'll tell you, there's a couple of legislators who are interested in trafficking out some of the states that are currently allowed of the use of industrial hemp in their state and have legalized it. Um, they're actually kind of making a trip out there in the summer to talk to some of the legislators and uh, talk to some of the business owners and some of the manufacturers and producers out in those states. So I'd like to see that other people 
um, that are other elected representatives are reminded enough to at least engage on the discussion because that's how we move forward for our state and not uh, for our economic development and for any other issues in which we can better work with that more freedom than the government might otherwise understand. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Feel free to look me up on Facebook and uh, on me, uh, Facebook, if you have any questions over this issue or any other any issues that are going to cross the government with as far as our state government is concerned. All right, so we got we're getting ready to do the raffle and we got any last tickets anybody wants to buy before we start it. Anyone? All right, all right. What time is it? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we need somebody to draw the winning tickets. Anybody? You know, just look at the couch. We've got a bunch here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. Here we go. All right, we're looking for ticket number 
for the marijuana legalization campaign, Amendment 64, which passed in Colorado in 2012, which actually legalized recreational marijuana, which is a huge step, not only for the United States, but for the world. I mean, it was the first place that ever to happen. So we're really pleased to have this here today. And he's also the uh, director of communications for the marijuana policy project, which is a huge group. Um, so basically, the, place, the way I phrase it is, they're putting the prohibitions in their place. Because somebody with, I mean, all these people who are continually speaking about, you know, with, you know, it's like, what, what area are you from? You're like from the 1930s, you know? And so Mason has been a huge component in the legalization effort because he has been one to stand behind reason and put these prohibitions basically in their place and using truth and science and, you know, overall education. And Mason is also a co-founder and director for SAFER, which is Safer Alternative for Joint Recreation, which was basically the main component of the campaign that marijuana is safer than alcohol. And so before we have Mason uh, come up here and deliver his speech, we have a short video for you guys. Okay. Okay. And then I have all these moms over here with whom I'm not clear that 
Now, this is like our first game. This is called the five game. So, so that one, we might have a terrible game skin. I Being so relevant, so weird. Uh, 
please, uh, when it comes to me and marijuana and actually how well it's done here, it's really worked out like quite how it was planned. So, you know, we have to be ready to have a high school of marijuana and alcohol and things can go up pretty damn well. It was like So, I first got into this issue, you know, let's go back. When I was in high school, I was a senior in high school, and I went out to a music festival, and I got so drunk that I was taking my hand to the hospital, where I had spent the night, and I woke up and had no idea what was going on. And basically, I was just told, if I was calling you a cab, there was a police officer there that was man who gave me or sold me enough of a substance that nearly killed me that night. It was just kind of, well, you know, that happens. Don't drink too much. And then, you know, I felt like that was kind of strange. But I think it's really cool to see it. So, you know, but it was, it was very good. And then, just about less than a year later, in college, my freshman year, I was uh, subpoenaed by a multi jurisdictional grand jury and drug task force in Richmond, Virginia, uh, under suspicion of being a marijuana consumer. Not suspicion of selling marijuana, owning marijuana. Uh, basically, I got called in because someone had got busted and listed about 25 people who had used marijuana that they loved. And so they basically called us all in and they wanted us to stay where we were going to come to the line. And they reached the So, you know, we're going to go into the whole of the details. Unfortunately, it didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, they passed away the kids during finals week, they come in at 6 in the morning, they really went out of the way to the total assets. Uh, maybe for those not getting out of the way, so it's But, uh, you know, long story short, nothing serious came of it. They asked me where to get that on parking lots of concerts. We used to have a bunch of people who might have this. How much does it cost? Too much. There is it. Not enough places. Um, basically, you know, I really came to realize how absolutely ridiculous the situation was that I could use enough of the one substance that's illegal and no one in law enforcement cares. Enough to almost kill me, but if I even am suspected of sitting in my corner room smoking a joint, every level of law enforcement from the TA down to campus police wants to know where I got. That's insane. And so it was right around the time that I started really getting into this issue. Uh, and you know, one of the things I always love when I come to see at the college campuses and see college students are engaged in this is, is like, you guys got such a start. I'm always so impressed. Uh, I haven't used very long in college. I didn't actually engage in any sort of civic activity surrounding it, so it's always incredibly impressive. Uh, but you know, I started to get interested in the issue. What's interesting is I, you know, I started following the Mark Gold and looking at, you know, looking at the Common you know, Policy Project. You know, I, I became the top guy. You know, I was the top guy. I was the top guy. You know, I was the top guy. And I basically, um, you know, I, I started thinking about getting the other involved. involved. And I saw that you know, I think it was at the time of the Common Policy Project had an internship program over the summer in DC, and I was like, wow, that would be cool. And I remember, you know, speaking to my dad and saying I was thinking about it, and, and, and feeling, even myself, like, I don't know if I hurt my resume when I'm trying to go get a job. And, you know, my dad had some more concerns, and I was, you know, Ooh, I didn't want people to think that I support this. Fortunately, I got it. But, you know, again, uh, it's, it's just absolutely, it was, it was crazy. Uh, by the time I, I did finish school as a teacher jobs, I did decide to get into this issue. I was looking at a wide variety of different things, but a lot of things I was trying to get into were virtual policy, marijuana policy, and just about everyone, you know, shot me shot down and I didn't get a job first. Finally, I did get a job working on marijuana policy. Uh, the marijuana policy time to go to Arizona. Um, I first shot out of college. It was for two weeks during the primary election to basically just made life hell for a particular Republican congressman who was opposed to that marijuana legislation. And it was a lot of fun. This is a good time. Um, unfortunately, that turned into another job working in the general election, and then came 
the next step. I went back on ACE, you know, this is the New York Journal of Health and Health ACE. And I sat down with the guy who hired me, Steve Fox. He had worked with the Maryland Health Practice Reason Mind that story is a lot of And he told me that he had this idea that he feels there's a way to go about trying to get marijuana that no one's doing, and people think he's crazy, but he, he knows that if, if it will work, we just need to do it. And he figured I would be a good person to do it. And so we talked about it. Finally, we got about the camp here that the Maryland Hospital went from the process um, He finally said to me, I will go ahead and give you a small little mini brand to shut up about this idea. And so he gave me about $32,000, I think it was, to go to Colorado and start an organization that was based entirely on education the public about the very simple fact that we're on state now. Because Steve felt that this was at the crux of this issue. This was the most important message he had across to this book. And seeing that of those people who recognized this very simple fact, I mean, I'm sure that everybody in the audience probably agrees. Many detractors will talk later, but I'm um, fairly certain most people agree. But unfortunately, most people at that time, most other people around, do not agree. And what he found is that all folks who do agree, 75% or more think it should be. And of those who think it's as harmful as alcohol or more harmful than alcohol, only about 20% of them think it should be. So he had this great idea of, well, people have been trying for the last several decades to convince people to make marijuana legal. Let's not worry about that and just convince people that marijuana is not going to happen. Because then by nature, they will agree, which is new, right? Simple, simple idea. I said, you know, at the time I was like, I used to work on marijuana and hey, that, that sounds like a good idea, it's logical, I can live with that, let's do it. And we went to Colorado and started an organization called State Group. And the first thing we did was work with college students to, uh, to get this message out again. The goal was not to convince people we were not to legal in this context. We were, we were running a campus referendum questions that said students should be punished any more than we are allowed to have trouble. Pretty simple. You know, kind of like when I was in college, I, I was told if you sit around and smoke marijuana in your car, you might get expelled or evicted from your work or you might get succeeded by a multi jurisdictional country. But if you want to go across the street to the houses, go ahead and let's police there and make sure that everyone's getting the most. Um, I'll really wrong with that. Um, and, and so the idea was not necessarily to change the answer process. We knew that that was going to be difficult. We knew the administrators might not. The idea was just to start this conversation and the idea was just to get the news. And to force people to think about this. And so that's what we did at the time. Vince was thinking about how was a big issue. This was a perfect setting outside of the went there. And there really wasn't anything happening with marijuana legalization. There were about 1,200 marijuana patients licensed at that time. So compared to now, there's about 100,000 marijuana patients. Um, but uh, the goal is just to force the public dialogue. Because we were convinced, I remember being convinced, that that is the only way we're ever. We can, you know, if it was just about having facts, it should be legal, right? You know, if it was about being right, it'd be over. It'd be over. So we gotta do something else. And so what we wanted to do was focus on getting the message out primarily through the media and starting conversations. And the reason that we felt that this was necessary, and the reason that we felt this message of marijuana being less harmful than alcohol was necessary, is because if you look at where marijuana prohibition came from, there's really no way to end it without doing this. You know, how did prohibition start? Basically, it started because there were a bunch of racist assholes who didn't like the people who were using marijuana. And so they injected a, a message into the news, you know, versus they were going to that most people know that all stuff, but not get the other words and all that. Um, but really, it's, you know, this yellow journalism, it's getting a message out of the news that they're all the news. They didn't say, like, you know, it wasn't like an anti tax campaign to make sure was, the nation wasn't generating revenue. It was an effort to make marijuana seem as harmful as possible so that people would want it to be a 
And so there were countless headlines. You know, they got law enforcement behind this, and they pushed this message through the media and around the country, and got people talking about how dangerous marijuana is. And it got to the point where not only were the states in the Southwest, where marijuana, where they were actually making a difference for the, the people who were suspected of using marijuana, who were using marijuana, people who were really the root of, of this whole thing. It wasn't even about that. Now we have states in the Northeast where there were no Mexican immigrants. Also saying, you know, there was no marijuana. There was no marijuana in the Northeast, really. But you have people in the Northeast now starting to pass laws saying it should be illegal because we've heard it's dangerous. So if you look at that, just how this issue is law, it's all been around the media and around the public dialogue spreading marijuana. From that point in time, you know, there was no discussion of marijuana, marijuana was okay, like the law, right? Then all the discussion became about how dangerous marijuana was. And that was the case all the way up until the early 70s. The only things you really ever heard about recreational marijuana use were negative. They were not about how bad it was, you know, resulting in addiction, murder, and all this you know, crazy shit. And it wasn't until really the early 70s when people like Stroud, the war was started in 1970. Dan Heath gets involved, people around the country. And you know, the Schaefer Commission you know, had this report from you know, Congress, and they said, oh, we're almost out of dangerous, and that's what we've been looking at, and so on. And of course, Congress and Richard Nixon and so on, they did that, and we all have permission to stay the same. But states started passing laws reducing the penalties for marijuana. <coughs> Colorado was one of them, Mississippi was one of them, Minnesota, Oregon. So, People started to kind of think about it, and started to see some positive discussion, at least some. And support started going up a little bit. It was 12% in 1969, yeah. Then we started to see it go up a little bit. Then Jimmy Carter got elected. Now we have the president talking about marijuana decriminalization positively. We see support go up more, because now the news and the public discussion is framed in a positive way, right? Then, great. <laughs> great. And what happens? All positive discussion about marijuana really just goes away. And it's, you know, the first thing that's great and makes a point to really focus on how bad marijuana and drugs and marijuana are. And we actually see support drop the time. But let it out. It wouldn't start going back up until the mid 90s. What happened in the, right around the mid 90s? 1996, California, first out of the marijuana law passed. Where did it come from? Generally, from the HIV AIDS community, we recognize how much, how much, you know, how beneficial it was to the people around here. Because this was at the height of the AIDS, you know, the AIDS epidemic. And these people in California said, we need to allow us to help our friends stop smoking. They passed this medical marijuana law. What is that? It generates a shitload of public media and public discussion, right? And all of a sudden, again, we're having a public dialogue on marijuana not being a bad thing. In fact, it's actually a good thing for some people. And as a result of all that public dialogue getting out around the country, we see more state passages. And then we start to see even state legislators, not just voter passages. And the, the, the dialogue is positive now for the first time. And that got us to a certain point, right? And it was really it was in 2005, and marijuana, although we now have several, you know, more than a couple, more than a dozen different marijuana states, we still were not breaking through on broader legalization, you know, reform. And so that's where this comes in, is that we needed another way to boost public discussion in a positive fashion. And how can we do that? Most advocates at that time, and I'm not confident, it, it, it makes sense, we're talking about the current prohibition. It's, it's a waste of law enforcement resources. It's a violation of civil liberties. It's disproportionately uh, targeting uh, communities of color. We could be generating tax revenue. We're forcing them into the underground market. All great arguments. All arguments I've made many, many times. But they can't be the first arguments they can make. Because the problem is, too many people still think marijuana is too harmful to allow us to use it. And as a result, when you say it's a waste of law enforcement resources to arrest people for marijuana, and someone thinks that it's an incredibly dangerous substance, they don't think it's a waste of law enforcement resources. If you say we need to turn the tax credit, they think it's an incredibly dangerous substance. They say, well, that's not what it is. So we really need to 
get at the root of why marijuana is illegal. And that is by addressing the perception of harm and surrounding. And so we launched a campaign to do just that, and to do it in a way that people would understand it. This country has a history of alcohol. We know the prohibition of alcohol is not People accept that. 90% of Americans have tried this. They're okay with the concept of adults using it, even though they know it's wrong. And no, let me just give a little quick, uh, you know, I, I'm not against alcohol. I, I think it's a wonderful substance to use responsibly. But the point is, you know, I'm obviously less harm. Right. But yet our society is embracing alcohol. We allow it. We have, I mean, you know, we push data. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. You know, we've got poor speed. You know, it's like we actually are willing to name our, our major sports games after beer companies. Um, we just accept it. So we decided we need to. Get people who accept alcohol use as a diagram to also accept that it's okay for adults to use marijuana. And so we started comparing the two and talking about how we could treat marijuana the same way that we treat alcohol. But guess what? It's actually less fun because we take more of a reason why we should do that. And we needed to get that message out, and so we focused on doing it in ways that were fun and creative and controversial. Because we didn't have a lot of money. And we wanted to get our message out as far as possible. And what better way to do that than to get news coverage? And what better way than that to get news coverage that is so fucking funny and makes me, which is really what we're talking about, because we didn't have money. Um, news coverage is funny and controversial that makes people talk about it. Because we're confident that the more people hear about it, the more people talk about it, the more support we're going to see. And that's generally what is in the trend. You know, you look at marijuana prohibition, you have virtually no discussion of it, then there was only a discussion of the ads, and then you saw the internet show up, and all of this, all of a sudden, there's part of all the time, a lot of people can communicate with each other. There's more stuff in the news, and as a result, we see more laws passing, more laws being discussed, and so on. So, we wanted to really force that type of thing. We ran a thousand dollars, we ran a whole debt for two of them. The point was it to win, it wasn't to make your own news. The point was just to get in the news and get this message out and to do fun things like uh, our mayor at the time, John Hill, Mayor Denver, made a fortune selling alcohol. He was a blue puppy here. We bought him a drug dealer. We chased around the chicken out and saying, what's so scary about marijuana when you support alcohol? Uh, we did all sorts of fun shit like that because we wanted to get people talking about this issue in a positive way. We wanted to say, hey, that a tall child maybe a drug dealer, and they might be sitting in the context of their juvenile and their assets to be one pension. At the time, they probably was. <laughs> but there was enough of the next. I mean, the idea was that if you have enough people having that conversation, you know, and have some of them are going to say, eh, we'll be able to And now you've got people talking to each other about this issue and hearing from each other. About how marijuana is not that bad. And hearing other people affirm that marijuana is actually less harmful than alcohol. And that's when minds change. You know, when someone so handed you a flyer and said, you know, here's an issue, think this way about it. And you already have an opinion about it, and you said, point, we'll change my mind. It doesn't really happen. Not often. <coughs> but what if someone that you know very well, a friend or a family member, a colleague, whatever, Says, oh yeah, well, I, I feel this way about that. We have a discussion about it, and they make their points and talk about it. Chances are that's going to have a lot more of an impact on what they're thinking about. And so we want those discussions. And so we did everything we could to foster those discussions. We ran local ballot initiatives, some of them, some of them. We ran a statewide initiative in 2006 to legalize marijuana. People told us crazy. They said we did it. Marijuana would never become legal in Colorado because we lose and it would look so bad, and that would be it. Yeah. So, um, but ultimately, that obviously was not the case, as we see. And we changed the way people in Colorado think about marijuana. People no longer think of it as this absolutely horrible thing that must be a thing because it's just too dangerous. But when we started having medical marijuana dispensaries opening up, whereas around the country, Arizona, Rhode Island, we have governors saying, Oh, no, 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 we've got to find a way to stop these dispensaries. We have legislators around the country saying, like, looking for ways to stop these. Our legislature said, 
we need to figure out how to control this and allow it. Because people were just thinking about it a little differently. And as a result, we had a huge amount of marijuana regulatory system pop up. It's not as easy as this start up, but we can move off that and lawsuits and so on. But the point being that the attitudes have been changing. And so by the time it got to around 2011, we have the public support, I mean, have the public efforts to convince people to donate the money to help us pass the initiative here. And now it came time to run this campaign, and what are we going to do? Well, we, we stayed true to what we talked about before. We didn't just you know, go off into the weeds with the standard arguments. For the first eight months, all the way up until August before the election, everything we really did focused on convincing people there were all those no it's not as harmful as alcohol. Convincing people that those who use marijuana are normal people, just like those who have a drink, and getting people to talk about this. We put up a billboard of a woman who looked like she could be, you know, a uh, suburban mom on her way out to the cocktail hour, you know, from her favorite mom mom. And she had said, for many reasons, I prefer marijuana over alcohol. Is that maybe a bad person? We had flyers that said something to the same effect. And every time we send out emails to our campaign list, it always asks people to share this or to talk with their friends. We created a whole campaign called Talk It Up Colorado. The whole point of it, the whole event, is its own website, was sending this written email to your, to your parents, to your grandparents. It was, you know, we have a Republican organization that works the campaign. If you know someone who's Republican, send this to your friends who are Republican and start talking about it. The Latino Forum signs up, they become an endorsement organization. If you have friends who might, you know, might find this interesting, where Latino community, please share to them, start a conversation, look for those things. You know, like we're going to do this wacky stuff. Please, like, you know, pass along, say it's funny and you want to talk about it. We even made a TV app that we ran on Friday before Mother's Day that featured a young woman sitting in a tree with her laptop. Typing out an email to her mom and said, You know, dear mom, to so, yeah, dear mom, uh, when I was in college, I used to drink a lot. It was actually kind of crazy. But now I use marijuana because it's less harmful for my body and I feel more comfortable using it than drinking and being around people using it instead of drinking. And I don't think that should be a problem. If you want to talk about it, I'd be happy to talk about it. And then, you know, URL, talking to Colorado. And people were like, this is insane. We don't spend money on TBS so we can talk to each other. We're supposed to mess with that and be convinced people that are watching people. But we knew that you know, at this point in time, people know they need to generate tax revenue. People know that law enforcement are spending their time on marijuana issues. People know that it's in the underground market. So we just need people to talk about it. And so we ran those types of ads. We only asked for money. Who can you just get out of uh, an email list for the what percentage of emails would you say are, are asking you for money? Oh, yeah. I'm not sure at all. <laughs> Out of our entire, for, for the course of the entire year, probably more than 150 emails, we sent two asking people for money. Now, I will say we were fortunate enough to have some funding that allowed us, you know, so that we knew that we'd be able to afford the <laughs> That's all. But the point being, we focused on that. In Washington State, and I'm not, I'm not being the campaign in Washington State in any way, they ran the campaign that they had run to win. And, and they did a great job. We did it differently. And they did not spend any time telling people to talk to each other about the issue. They really just focused on, you know, being quiet, the new people were supportive, and they had all sorts of endorsements they just wanted to prove. We knew that it wasn't going to be the same case in Colorado. We had the current governor, the past two governors, doing radio ads against us. The attorney general, you know, every elected official, tons of city and city governments, all of those, every business organization, the chamber of commerce, the local chambers of commerce, everyone is coming out against us. Very different experience in Washington than virtually no opposition. We had eight hundred thousand dollars spent against us, they, you know, which is Far more, I think they have about 17,000 spent against them. Uh, and it was all by medical marijuana activists who were upset with a couple of admitted the shitty parts of their law. Um, but the point is, we wanted to try something new, and we did. And in the end, they got 56%, we got 55. We have far more Republicans, far fewer Democrats, 
And we still we manage to almost get the same percentage. And what was interesting is when you look at the exit polling, in Washington State, they found that 4% said they heard something positive about their initiative from a friend or family member. In Colorado, it was 13. And so clearly what we did was work if we were out there talking to people about it. That would be, it would be that big disparity without that type of effort. And it worked. And that's what we need to keep doing. We need to force this discussion. You guys are in a state where you have some stuff going on, and that makes things a lot easier. You've got bills in the legislature. You've got a, you know, an organization that's pushing for a statewide outreach. There is a lot happening, and the most important part of this is talking about it. Now, people in this room who are willing to, to who are this supportive already might already be talking about it, but we know. Has been, does anyone here know people that they you know, a family member, a parent, a grandparent, some people are like, man, you know, they're very conservative, you know, they don't support the people. You know those, you know, I guess, fucking cool friends of them. I'm not here. Um, I don't that term. <laughs> Point being, um, you know, if you haven't talked to them yet, then you haven't done everything you can do. A lot of times people feel like they can go out and hand out flyers, go to an event, have a booth. They can, you know, distribute literature. They can do, you know, make phone calls to voters. They can do all these things. But if they've never talked to their grandmother, like the person who loves them more than anyone. You know, we need to make sure people are doing that. So that would be something. If it doesn't apply to me, because I'm already hanging out to chat about me and your grandma. <laughs> Tell other people you know. <laughs> um, but that is how we're going to get to make things. You know, you guys have some time before like to say my mission is going to come up. There needs to be this discussion. It needs to occur. So when these new stories are coming out about a bill in the legislature moving forward, make a conversation about it. The, this, the, the, the um, you know, uh, the sort of horrible case this gentleman is going to be for the rest of his life, you know, share that with people so that they know about it. You know, make sure everyone in the room knows about these things. It's that type of public discussion that's going to result in these things changing. And more, most importantly, don't just say, this is my, don't just say, you know, I know you can marijuana is horrible, but do you think it's fair for this guy to be in Just say, why? Should, there's nothing wrong with an adult using marijuana. You know? We're right. We have that. We have that luxury, right? This is not a debate. This is us saying what's right and people failing to acknowledge it or refusing to acknowledge it. So it shouldn't be difficult to get this message out. It's really easy to speak truth to power when our truth is so powerful. And when it comes to talking to someone that you know, someone that you trust and can trust you, the worst thing that could possibly happen is that you're going to be right and you're going to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, things are possible. When we started in Colorado, people told us that nothing was going on, and we wouldn't be able to pass a measure, and people would give us money. People said that our messaging was wrong. People you know, said that our tactics were wrong. We were too aggressive. We were saying the wrong things. We shouldn't be doing it. And in the end, we did what we knew was right. And things worked out. Colorado's not the first state in the country that was made marijuana for adults. And at this point, things aren't over. There's a lot of, a lot of people who talk about this issue and say, oh, marijuana's legal in Colorado. What's next? This is really a, a new beginning. I won't say it's the beginning, but it's a new beginning. The, the discussion is still there. We still have the same opponents still saying the same things about dangerous marijuana. And we, this conversation is not going to end. It's never going to end. You know, Colorado started allowing Sunday liquor sales in 2007. You know, it took that long for them to say, you know, this is stupid. Why don't we just let people want to live on Sundays? Like, we still have a grocery store lobbyists fighting with liquor store lobbyists over who gets to sell folks right here. You know, we still have discussions about what should we go, you know, how should we handle DUI without that. The same thing is going to happen in marijuana. Conversation is not going to end. It's going to go on forever. 
And keep that in mind, because if we simply try to get people, we try to convince them that, you know, we don't want a bad approach that works, then in the long run, it's not going to solve the problems that you're inevitably going to see. Because for those are the problems we have. If, if marijuana use among adults goes up, if marijuana use among teens goes up, I mean, if, if you can say marijuana's bad, the approach is worse, and now tons more people are using marijuana, you're gonna, a lot of people are going to be concerned. If the whole time you've been saying, hey, there's nothing wrong with adults using marijuana, it's far less harmful than alcohol, and now there's an increase in use, we're still right. You know, who cares if there's more adults using marijuana? So, my point is, we need to really start talking about this positively, talking about adults using marijuana as something that's okay. And once we try and once we get them to understand that, that's when we go to those next arguments. That's when we say, hey, now that you understand what we're talking about, we're talking about less harmful substances than alcohol. Now let's talk about tax revenue. It makes sense to judge tax revenue. Now let's talk about law enforcement resources. It, it doesn't make sense for law enforcement to spend their time in these resources. So that's, that's what I encourage people to think about, is to address marijuana itself when you're talking to people. And most importantly, please, please focus on those closest to you first, because that's where we win. And quite frankly, you know, there's, there's no other way. We're not going to see these laws change on their own. We're not going to win by doing everything that people have been doing for the last 30 years. That got us to a point. But at this point, we need to do something new. In Colorado, we try something new. We need to try it again. We can't say for sure whether it's a be all and all. We need to do, we need to replicate it. We're trying to. We're now doing the same thing in states around the country. We put up a billboard uh, in, in Portland, Oregon that had a you know, uh, love of beer, a glass of wine, and beer wine. It's a beer wine safer. We put up uh, bus ads throughout Portland, Portland, Maine that had you know a young woman that said, "I prefer using marijuana because it's less toxic and doesn't give me a headache." And a, a young guy saying, "I use marijuana instead of alcohol because it doesn't make me high on vitamins." And it's tough to do these kind of things. And these are the places where we're now seeing some <coughs> of the The places that are having these discussions is where the support is growing. And once the support goes enough, there's an interest in providing money, resources, and so on. So please get out there and talk to people. One of the first things that I always say when I finish one of these events is tell people that you're doing this. Start the conversation when you can speak at how is at this event because I care about this issue. If you talk to your parents on the phone, you know, or standard Sunday couple call them mom and dad, you know, and ask them what you've been up to, let them know that you went to this event. It's a great way to start the conversation, and that's how we're going to win. So thank you guys very much for having me. Because the difference is going to come 
in those people who are currently 11 years old. And instead of growing up and coming through you know, middle and high school, knowing that marijuana is entirely illegal and this horrible thing that can't be used by everyone, now it's okay for adults. Now they're actually going to grow up knowing that marijuana is basically like alcohol. And when they become older and they're trying to you know, decide when they go to college and they're thinking about it, are they going to be more inclined to try marijuana than they would have before? I think they will. This is, this, is, um, this is something, another thing that I argue with people in this movement about. People who deny that there will be more marijuana use. I think that's fucking crazy. Like, that's assuming that 50% of Americans are so moral and can, you know, think marijuana is evil, but they haven't tried it, of course. They didn't try it enough to do So, I, I, I think that there's a few people, not immediately, but over time, and I don't think that's a problem. But it hasn't yeah, right? But it hasn't happened yet. Uh, I guess my major concern right now with not only Colorado, but Washington, other states uh, is the the giant excise tax and everything else that's based on it. Is it true that currently the price of marijuana in the legal market is more expensive than what you can typically buy in the black market? And if so, I guess I mean, are you concerned about it, or do you think that the price is going to be Well, the price for absolutely and this is basically the same thing that happened with marijuana. Some stores began opening. They were charged like a certain amount of more stores would be opening. People began knowing the four stores, and you know, they they had to start competing prices like that. Right now, you know, there are new businesses opening all the time, especially there are some localities that they have to be um, there are going to be localities that currently are not open that absolutely are going to call out for the second largest city in the state. They decided to ban dispensary or retail from their market so they have the second most medical stores in the state. They decided to ban retail stores barely because the mayor was so against it. That's going to change once that mayor is no longer in office. I mean, they actually just decided to allow a marijuana, a private marijuana club. That hasn't happened in Denver. So we're going to see that change. We're going to see that occur. In terms of the tax, you know, number one, it will be allowed if you know, the price goes down. Number two, the underground market prices are, are not are not that much lower, if lower at all. Number three, what's the price of alcohol at your local store in the area that price of alcohol? You have no clue. Because that's just the price of alcohol. It's not shit. So you know, for someone who grew up back in the day, I don't even have to pay it. You know, well, most people are gonna grow up knowing that the nickel value cost is Anyways, whatever it's going to cost. Um, but ultimately, I don't think it's going to be preferences, at least not under the laws in Colorado. Um, the tax structure there is not so high. When you think about it, um, when you think about it, you know, really think it through uh, logistically, let's say. You know, I'm, it's Friday. I want to get some marijuana for the weekend. Am I going to start calling around looking for someone I know who has some marijuana or knows someone who has some marijuana? And, I mean, I hope it's marijuana that I like and not a different kind of marijuana. Um, I, I hope that it costs less. I hope that I don't have to meet them somewhere. I hope they're not cheap. I hope they give me what they say it is. Or am I going to stop at the store and pick from all the marijuana that's great and I'm going to know that it's a new thing, it's not shady, and I have no marijuana. That's what I'm going to do. And most people are going to do it. Even if not everybody does it. Enough people are going to do it that the economic incentive for someone selling it illegally is going to go down to the point where it's not quite as, as worthwhile. And then as a result, growing it illegally, the economic incentive goes down because you don't have to be people who will sell it illegally for you. And now, basically, you're going to do that. When you use the article, marijuana safety and alcohol, in Colorado, on the course, did the course or the liquor, liquor industry generally? React? Did they attack? Did they fund the opposition? No. Um, there's really never been any real formal opposition, paid opposition, from the liquor industry, with the exception of in California in 2010, um, the distributor, the beer distributors there, did give a, a minute, a pretty small amount, it was like 10,000, 20,000 
which is generally a statement of pretty small value. And even then, it was based on, you know, the Chamber of Commerce was opposed based on women's issues. They were chipping in because they were a member. It was really based on employment and drug testing. So it wasn't so much like competition, like we wanted to work with any of our alcohol against marijuana. Um, but that may not remain the case. Uh, I know that some members of the alcohol industry do not like me and what I go around saying. Why? I'm just talking honestly about their product. You can tell them that look. Um, but uh, it's, it's definitely a discussion that's taking place. I actually just got invited a couple days ago. A few of my colleagues have already done practical commitments to speak at some you know, conference of uh, the you know, Legal Spirits Council that's putting on this act. Like, like, walk in, you know, and the doors get shut behind and just pop the bags in the room and <laughs> turn around and look at the you know. Yeah, but no, they haven't yet. But ultimately, I, I think. Um, you know, generally we don't see the same tobacco, we always see tobacco companies are like, opposing or supporting. Uh, you know, generally what tends to be the case is that the people who are most likely to be against us are the ones that those industries are most likely to support. It's not that they're supporting those candidates because they don't like marijuana, it's just that they're supporting certain candidates, and those are the types of candidates that are oftentimes you know, so, I'm the person in the I was moving out last weekend with the day before 2420. And long calls, I said, tell me all about that. I can see what my profile is in there. The other one is like some guy that shot at daylight, and then some guy that thought I was going to be in the before he brought the call up from that. This is a huge, I mean, I'm glad you brought it up. Like, it's probably a longer discussion we, we have here. Um, so, for those of you that there were two incidents in the last uh, month, basically, the first was a 19 year old uh, college student from Miami who hit this friend's eight, uh, and, uh, eight bunch of edibles, and then he had reportedly freaked out and he either fell or jumped off of the uh, balcony at a hotel. Um, he was crazy, like playing the role was ending, all sorts of, you know, being clearly freaked out. There's still, of course, you know, people looking for details, but it is known, uh, at least according to the friend. <laughs> That he made six times more than I expected to see in what the pack said. Now, here's my problem. Now, I, um, as a surprise to people, I've been complaining about Apple since we're on Not because I think they should be legal, but because if they're going to be legal, we need to treat them much, much, much more controlled fashion. Because edible marijuana is not the same as smoking or as marijuana. And and people need to know that, especially when you're talking about, you know, a 19 year old from out of town who's, you know, people who have never eaten. And, and this is where the issue comes in, and there are people in the industry that don't, aren't going to like what I have to say about it. But you get, they're selling a product that's like the size of a candy bar or a Tootsie Roll that has, a, you know, enough for six people to, to get completely fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's the thing. I don't know about you guys, I've never told you the camera that you can go home to. That's almost like sacrilegious. Uh, but if you're talking about Jimmy Rock, you can get it for like just six or six people. This young guy, or the musician, this young guy, he ate something that's 60 year old entities. The standard serving that's been established by the state is 10 million. This was, he bought one cookie that had 60. And he had said on it to, you know, that there were six servings. And he was even told by the people who were in the room before me that they should eat a sixth of it. And then they should wait an hour or so and see if they need more. He ate a sixth of it. They waited an hour, maybe a little more an hour. They didn't do anything to eat the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing is that if you're talking about one package of cookies and a, a fraction of a plus of course, Maybe someone would be inclined to invest the cookie. If you're talking about what is it? The six cookies. Because they were worried it wouldn't be enough. And he ate one cookie and it didn't do anything. Would he eat the other five? No, he'd probably eat one more. And so that's a packaging issue. That's a matter of creating a standard of how much THC you can have in an individual product. And I think it should be limited. Not for medical, there are sick people who need a lot for a small amount. But I'm talking about for adults, retail use, we need to change the way that these products are being made. There are also now, there's a bill that's been passed that uh, marks, you have to have standard 
mark on certain products so people know that's a matter of preventing accidental consumption because if someone doesn't know they're eating marijuana and then they freak out because of it. So it, it's definitely a big issue and we can't really avoid it. We can't just say, oh, you know, what's in marijuana? It might be that these people have underlying mental health problems that very well can be the case. But if we're not doing everything we can to make sure they know that's a problem for people with marijuana health problems, mental health problems, we're not doing everything we can to make sure they don't use too much of it and so on, then, you know, that's the perfect thing. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention the other incidents that people know. Uh, a man uh, shot and killed his wife. It, it's, it's a horrible story. She was on the phone with Brian Lee, and she said that her husband had made a patient at all, and she also said he had been on the her, but he had freaked out, again, talking about the end of the world, freaking out, and then she then like on the phone with Brian Lee, and he's going to get her shot out of the gun safe. The gun's in the safe. He took it out, and he shot her. She and uh, this has been a huge story because there's also all sorts of issues surrounding the response rate. 911, the closest to these stations is a, a mile down the road. It's you know, 17 minutes to respond. And by the time truth gets out, there's even more discussion about it. It's that too. Emergency room visits, you know, there are a lot of them. Relatively speaking, you know, there's probably more kids going into the emergency room for eating or having makeup than for you know, eating and you know, edible products. But the fact is, there are more than the room for. Maybe it's because people are more trying to take them the across the world, they don't get as much trouble. Um, but we can't, we can't have that. And uh, of course, you know, these people get put in a dark room and uh, you know, set it up and fine. But it's going to be a lot harder to pass these laws than if you've got you know, an increase of 300% in emergency room visits um, next year. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean people die or but it's not. I, I totally agree with your idea of uh, educating people with THC is not such a dangerous thing, and the history of it being wise in the 20s and 30s. I feel like the story goes a little farther back that the, the, the rise was started by industries that wanted to compete with them. And I think that that issue still comes today, and the problem I have with MPP is I'm not aware of you supporting or publicizing the hemp issue. And well, I'm wondering what the options of that, because there's a massive movement to stop global warming. And if hemp can be the alternative, the best alternative, supposedly, why is it that just as important to a big juicy issue to publicize as well? Uh, well, we did the Measure so this one is now legal, and that was a big discussion of the letters that you included because of some legal issues. Uh, we included in every law that we write uh, so for broader legalization, so to speak. Uh, we also um, we you know we sent out a bunch of the letters that uh, ran all day and it's gone through the Congress. Uh, we we sent out alerts about it. Uh, but ultimately, we also work with the Hemp Industry Association. There are folks who are working directly on related stuff. So we let them take care of support opening up the research to redefine the hemp. It's not just this all for low THC. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we can support it. Well, the thing is, it's like you're kind of like encouraging the folks at the AIDS Foundation to raise money and research. They're, you know, like you're saying, kind of its own issue. And so our organization is working on ending marijuana prohibition and allowing adults to use marijuana without peer punishment, allowing people to use the medical marijuana. We want to include them in every possible way, but we're writing these laws we are. Uh, but in terms of devoting existing resources to them, that's not why people are supporting our organization. They know that if they want to support us, Uh, I have my own idea of what 
my response would be. But uh, one that I'm always interested in is if on the marijuana is safer than alcohol. And you and you've heard it even in the Hazy Grace, and you know, I've heard it even more of that being the argument. Is that, well, we've, we've got, you know, just because marijuana is safer than alcohol, you know, if, if alcohol is dangerous, why do you why 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 do you lie or have another you know, psychoactive or, or dangerous substance? Um, Perhaps I'm sure you've been in the face of the argument multiple times and practiced that response to myself. So this is not here. That's where the alternative in the organization named Safer Alternative from the religion. And one of the reasons that Steve actually worked part of the idea behind the thing was not just educating people about marijuana and safe and alcohol, but also talk about marijuana as a less harmful alternative to alcohol. And we've been very upfront about talking about that. Like the idea that people use marijuana and replace it alcohol, whether it's entirely because they you know, have problems when they drink, or whether it's just on occasion, like a college student who is would like to stay in tonight and smoke some of these video games, but you know, doesn't want to get in trouble. So on this occasion, they're gonna go out drinking and bump into someone and start playing and there's some songs. Uh, whether it's uh, whether it's once or whether it's always. Uh, the idea that adults should have this type of alternative is important. And we have seen some research showing that these are marijuana substitutes, and that some people, when presented with a legal choice to use marijuana, may use less alcohol. Uh, one, one study, for example, by my health and health professor in Colorado and a couple others around the country, they found that uh, traffic fatalities associated with DUI are going down more in states with medical marijuana laws than in states without them uh, since they passed the medical marijuana laws. And one of the theories, this is not a theory of course, but one of the theories is that there's less drinking taking place and more marijuana use. And as a result, because of alcohol is so great at the time, traffic and drugs, we're seeing fewer drug um, So this is something that Steve and I in particular have been pushing for a long time, this concept of you know, encouraging like a, a if a therapist is meeting with a, a husband and wife and, and they love each other and everything, but the guy's a drinking problem and gets violent in the drinks. The therapist should say, Every time there's a mom, maybe you should use that instead. You know? So, but that's just an example. I mean, the idea that we give people an alternative that they can get intoxicated without drinking. Can I rephrase the question with an analogy? Is that important, but I guess what I'm saying is, you, you got marijuana is safer than alcohol. Okay. Well, rape is, is less bad than murder. But rape is not bad. But they're, they're not. But I, mean, I guess what I'm just saying is you're going to hear the argument that just because you know, <laughs> marijuana is you're less bad than alcohol, what are you going to have a problem? And either you can say we would better off using marijuana instead of alcohol. I mean, what else are you going to say? And then the point is that, like, even the New York Times says, what I was saying, Steve and I have been pushing this message for a long time. A lot of people haven't really liked it uh, in the movement. But the New York Times in January came out with an editorial called Marijuana and Alcohol. And it said that if alcohol use goes down in states because they do lose marijuana, it makes it this work. Mark Fryman, I don't know if anyone here, people know Mark Fryman, it's his habit to work today. But he's a, <laughs> he's a company <laughs> He's a, he's a professor at UCLA. He's just involved in Washington State's regulatory stuff. Uh, he's he's one of the the opinion of like marijuana's bad, but prohibition is bad, so we need to regulate it and make it as hard as possible for people to get while still allowing them to get it. Whereas our in Colorado, we were really like people want it, they should be allowed to have it. So um, this guy, he has even said uh, that if marijuana, if marijuana is also less alcohol use. It will be the best reason to legalize marijuana in this country. Even if we don't generate tax revenue, even if you know everything else aside, it always goes down because the cost of society is worth it. So the idea is that we have this argument if, if you're concerned about alcohol use, why would you not want an adult to use a less harmful substance instead? It's not rational public policy. <laughs> so you know, when you look at it, you can say, well, you know, the social and economic the social uh, Public health process is new without marijuana. According to the research, what they try to cure them with Why would you not want to make marijuana available for them to use it instead? And also, we point out that the public and social costs associated with marijuana, according to the research, are not very much well in Which comes back to this point that there's nothing wrong with using marijuana. If you're an adult, you can be responsible. Can I just say a point of medical opinion back? 
we didn't really have significant that much from, from the medical marijuana community. Uh, you know, of course, there are certainly always going to be some people who are more vocal than others, and it's it's attractive to the media when they get to talk about someone who's pro marijuana being against marijuana legalization. Uh, I think a lot of that, like in California, the whole thing with growers, I think it's blown a lot of proportion uh, because what you're talking about is really a very limited number of people. Uh, we had our petition, we can circulate 150 medical marijuana businesses. Uh, you know, by and large, medical marijuana patients are, are on board, as long as you're not including something that seems like it would be problematic. For example, Washington State, they included the first state DUI uh, uh, laws in the law. That would sell a lot of people in the medical marijuana community, and understandably so, we could not include that for that specific reason, not that we didn't think it's wrong, we want to have it. Um, and then, of course, you know, when it comes to the industry, that was certainly, you know, things like making sure that they are able to transition into this new industry because, quite frankly, you know, these are people who risk their livelihoods to provide that for a lot of people for a long time, and they should be able to do that. Uh, so it wasn't significant. It's what you're going to have some people who think there should be no control and no regulation internally. A lot of folks in the medical marijuana community who have a problem, which are not many, uh, they have a problem with medical marijuana law too. They said the medical marijuana law was shit when it's proposed, and now they're saying, well, this is the current medical marijuana law, which we used to oppose because we you know it's. So, anyway, I, mean, I don't think it's a huge issue, but you have to take into consideration we draft our law, we include it every week, we put ads in the magazine to say, please send us your comments on what you think should or should not be. And we have the database so we can look at it. I'm looking at see what they really said. Uh, we have business owners, we have people who you know, represent patients and all that. Am I correct that the Colorado legislature has now enacted a per se impairment amendment and it has screwed those who wish that your constitutional amendment would have tied their hands and not be able to do that? They didn't create a per se They created a uh, rebuttal exemption. Uh, which is basically, per se, is like how you have a problem. It means if you're caught in the past 200 years, you're automatically going to be in the what Well, that actually uh, was, our legislature tried to pass that. Uh, and on at least three occasions, they have moved down. Uh, we worked to, to defeat that. Um, it wasn't until after our law passed that they managed to get to it wasn't per se. It's this other way of looking at it, which means that you can go to a jury. And say uh, for these reasons, you know, I'm a little bit of a I wasn't even demonstrating impairments. Uh, you know, I'm a medical impairment patient who, you know, here's a, a test I took, you know, I used it for three weeks. That sounds a little better than Washington's, but much. as Dan was suggesting, it should be performance based. Oh, absolutely. And would you suggest to us that we make sure that impairment is defined based on performance and not? Blood content. If I am one hundred percent, it should be based on, on actual impairments. And the same argument if you get alcohol. I mean, some fifty-five-year-old guy who's been having a scotch at work every day for the last thirty years, and they not demonstrate as much impairment as when he's driving at point oh eight as some twenty-one-year-old who's never really drank before and has point oh seven. And our law allowed voters to get in trouble. It's just that we got to find a way to know the students, but it's not personal. So we actually do in the jury have a rebuttal presumption. Of For alcohol, we did. Really? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And that's not a guarantee. Now you can make a case, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, is that in Colorado, you could have a full law passed and that specific law passed. You could have a blood diagram, and it's not going to be that way to do things in Colorado. You could have 10 years and it's not going to be that way to do things Our society, our legislators, want to. Thank you. 
everything has it. So yeah, it's something for you know a ballot initiative team or you know an organization or an official to consider. I don't know what if you could like. I mean, if you're talking about literally prohibiting the government from setting some sort of way to deal with people that are not on. Just for engaging in a legal activity off the job, right? Great. So it goes to court, and what they find? Well, it's still legal federally, so there is still a way for them to fire. Now, federal law changes and everyone becomes legal at the federal level, that very well might be to like to go away. When it comes to governments, there's very little you can do. Uh, when it comes to private companies, I mean, private companies say that you can't smoke cigarettes. Because it jacks up health insurance costs. I mean, they'll say all sorts of things. Um, I'm confident that at least for a lot of people in terms of private businesses, you know, governments very different. For private businesses, the, the culture shift is what's going to really be the biggest thing. Do people really want to or feel the need to fire, rehire, retrain, and all that? And, and you know, when the person's perfectly qualified and wasn't using them on the job. And there's already a lot of businesses. Don't drug test for that reason. Uh, there was uh, a survey done by one of the employment organizations in the state, and it was the results were all completely shitty because like seventy five percent of the respondents were government agencies, right? And feel the obligation to respond and they wanted to keep their job. But you know, like eighty percent didn't respond. But what was interesting is there were a couple. I think there were like in certain cases there were like one or two or three of businesses that you know they broke down like. One to ten employees, ten to fifty, fifty. Like there were a couple that had like five thousand, ten thousand, ten thousand plus that had changed. They had to change their policies for better cases. And now most didn't, but that's the model. Yeah, I was originally asked someone question by Fox News about the one one. Do you think that maybe it's longer than particularly in Washington and Colorado? Football stars. You know, I mean, as the laws start changing, that maybe someone can help advocate to spread the word. You've heard of like through the NBA and NFL. We've been working on the NFL for a while. I started at the first NFL program in 2007, uh, asking Ricky Williams uh, to come up there with a piece of support the signature. And we have finally got some traction. I mean, we do, uh, we, I went down in front of the NFL headquarters. Back then, to you know, yell at Roger Goodell, the commissioner, and no media showed up in New York City. And then during the Super Bowl, we put a bunch of billboards surrounding the Super Bowl, and I went out to Roger Goodell's office and had a bunch of cameras. And there's clearly a momentum. Uh, players are increasingly speaking out, whether it's because they're saying it should be allowed or because they're saying um, they know other players use marijuana. 
which is not great, but that's a good point. Are you telling them also saying that like, with their injuries or yeah. whatever they do, like the strike box and all that, like that have been Yeah, and, and it's tough for them to speak out. You know, the ones that have, like this is really important, uh, who, you know, is also very vocal on um, the gay rights issue, the gay marriage issue. Uh, he spoke out of it. It's a great sports um, of HBO. Uh, so there have been players who are in the current speaking out about it. And the NFL owner, Vidal, actually even said, well, if our doctors agree that it would be safe, and, you know, maybe we would be able to do it. But of course, they have doctors are idiots. Um, <laughs> but at least when it comes to this. Um, so it's the, it's, you know, here's the biggest thing that's going to drive people are fans are increasingly pissed off because as fans, more and more think that was not a big deal, and more and more we think about oh, shit like we're in Bush Stadium, like it looks worse and worse for the league, and the league actually has to has to change. We uh, we put a board in in Las Vegas, we just get our shot as a junior. And he used to be in California, and he did it in like a five year with a hundred dollars. He got in contact with me. Uh, Nine hundred thousand dollars to build a billboard, you know, calling it out and calling the Nevada State Athletic Commission to, you know, change their policy. It wasn't necessarily directly because of us, but they now they've changed and they're moving in a different direction. The world has no meaning. They lowered the limit at which it's considered a positive test. So, like, what we're getting into is metabolites, you know, so it's a week ago. They, they brought it down so that the level is, you know, or excuse me, they made it a higher threshold, so it's harder to test positive. It's still, you're still getting in trouble now. It's doing you know, only important to the NBA. Yeah, I mean, the NBA three times before they even, you know, notify the public. The third has to be within six months of the second, and they just basically set the back. Yeah, we're going to make that I think you want those on top, right? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, you want two minutes off. Yeah. And leave the no, leave the last one.
is the thing is like uh, yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. Number one, yeah, I agree. I never, never will say marijuana is safe or harmless. I will only say it's safer than alcohol and less harmful than alcohol. But with regards to schizophrenia, yeah, basically, there, you know, the only real evidence there is suggests that people with schizophrenia and might be exacerbated if they use marijuana. Packaging in Colorado mainly requires the best margin. Um, just like, you know, we know that if you're pregnant, you should be informed that alcohol will dramatically affect your child. Um, so it's definitely addressed that, as we pointed out, yeah, despite increases, massive increases in marijuana use, the level of schizophrenia has remained entirely the same. And there are also some mental health conditions we find that marijuana alleviates some of the systems, right. like particularly like to certain kinds of depression and anxiety. But yeah, we need to make sure people know. I just wanted to add on that the research I've been doing is what I some new study came out within about six weeks or so. I find it for you if you want to know. They're finding correlation between like oxytocin schizophrenia and taking oxycontin in those meds and smoking cannabis and that creating the episode, not the cannabis being the cause. Yeah. It's being it's the combination effect, not the cannabis is by itself, but it is actually helping. It's when they're mixing. Right, and, and I've seen some stuff like that, and I've also seen stuff for specifically like strains that have a higher CBT content and uh, being potentially you know, you know, problematic. Thank you, Father. Questions? Right, that's under the ratio. Yeah, right now. Uh, now, what about full legalization of health and species of CBT 9? That's what I like. Yeah, John. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, short answer is, uh, I mean, it's, it's viable in the sense that it's still there. Yes, technically. But it's heard in the committee. Uh, the committee has not voted it out. What they're talking about with more law, I don't know that this is going to happen at this point, because uh, I think that what the, the requirement of it is just to make a medical substitute for the legalization bill and advances out of that committee. I mean, the committee is called by the substitute one bill for another at the academic period to decide what they want to do and 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 what they want to do, etc. And so the committee, when we heard that bill, they said, oh, we'd like to have a medical marijuana. We'd not like that idea of the legalization. Uh, but nonetheless, it has basically a very, it's a sort of the uh, public safety, uh, the crime prevention of public safety which has every single yeah. form of law enforcement official in the House of Representatives on it. Uh, that was a very clear message there. You're sending this bill to your adopting. And actually, what they fundamentally do is they didn't really like the idea of the legalization, but everyone on those, actually, I think one member said, if you were to have this, this is just a matter of law, I don't think you have a no vote to get this to me. Uh, and so I think that was really remarkable. Uh, and so I think that what has happened is that the Senate bill, uh, Senate Bill 951, has kind of uh, the problem with the bill that was going to come out that day. And so it, it's, if we can get that over from the Senate, the House of Representatives, that would be my back after that. So at this point, I think it's unlikely to come out of that committee. So how likely would you feel in the next few years federal government to schedule? Uh, it depends on some things. I mean, one of the real questions to ask is, I think, at least in terms of these new past laws, we are hoping to be too fast to us. Another really important thing is that if you, you do not want marijuana to be sick, you want marijuana to be sick. Um, alcohol, not a schedule of drug. You know, even with marijuana from schedule one, schedule two, we're still, you know, we're talking about, like, you know, there is a bill pending to do that, that right? There's no one not to do it since they were moving that they're all in. Uh, yeah, there are several bills in Congress. One would actually regulate it like uh, now, it's Jared Mills from Long Island, so that would actually take it out of the jurisdiction of the EDA, do its EDAT out to take it off the schedules, and you know, none of them are interested. Uh, the better one would be David Mark Alford from California, which has the most sponsors, the most bipartisan support, which would basically just um, it doesn't codify what's currently happening. So, in other words, if you're in a state where it's legal, uh, you're immune from federal prosecution. So, basically, taking the formal of the government's argument. So, it really, you know, right now, 
what's interesting is you're during uh, uh, Justice uh, Senate Judiciary Hearing, or House Judiciary Hearing, just a few weeks ago, he um, was asked about class classification, and he said that he would be happy with the administration's happy to talk to Congress about changing their whole schedule for Congress, and Congress is not happy with anything. So, um, so, so in terms of like number of years, it's, it's really hard to ever say. It depends on the administration is going to be, you know. Okay, what do you have to well, there's a lot of debate happening within this movement. I mean, some people say that you know, the uh, Controlled Substances Act gives the authority, the authority to give it to the Justice Department. And then the Justice Department basically said, you need to be a to handle this for us. So in theory, you know, the Attorney General of the Justice Department is sort of the president. The president. the president could say, well, why do I want this? So the Justice Department can do it. Of course, the law of the administration is saying, well, no, we need Congress to get out of this other tools. So nobody wants to get it. Yeah, so, you know, I try to not, you know, I'm not worried about it. I think the quickest way to address it is to keep asking the laws. I know, I mean, I have to review about it. If we didn't have Barack Obama in the White House right now, if we had Obama versus in the White House right now, very unlikely we would have this policy of tolerance and tolerance in Washington. And Obama has done a lot of things like that. Right. But that's one thing we did that we can all be very grateful for. And that could very easily change with the next generation of us, no matter who the president is. We can't take any of the grants. Mr. Long, those lines, right? Really, the president would like to have a challenge with laws and programs. Yes, they certainly go before. They don't have a challenge with the whole scope of the program. They have a lawyer to the court, for example, over the term. And they have a problem with the law, which is that the law works more in the Yeah, I absolutely do. I don't see it. I mean, I just feel like what's really interesting is when the Justice Department came out and came out and they just, you know, they just, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know, it's did you see a lot of Republicans that like, make a big speech about it? Like, think about everything Obama does. And every Republican makes a huge deal about it. I mean, way more horrible than they did actually is. No one did anything because the Republicans are going to realize they're not going to support something to say. They realize that nothing is gained by that. I would also add that if they, if a next presidential administration actually did bring to the federal court to say these laws are incompatible with, you know, with supremacy laws, I think they would lose. I think they would lose it very, very badly because, look, state law does not have to mimic federal law. Uh, they can, you know, federal law, they can still come in and enforce federal law. No one seriously disputes their ability to do that, uh, but the states don't have to. They can say, look, we're not doing it anymore. We want to enforce your crazy law, that's fine. Uh, and there's no constitutional theory that says that the state's back in the Couldn't the feds prohibit the states from licensing yes. or the state activities? Yes, that they can do. They can't force them to like, arrest them. Right. So it would still, and in theory, I think they're a government position where they're trying to put them in control. Like, that federal government's going to be like, whoa, like, if you just want it to be a free for all, we want to prohibit you from controlling them. Yeah, if they manage to do that, okay. Yes, I'll be interested. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I have family who works in the Division of Family Services, and one of the issues that I have come up, with, uh, come up against time and time again is that people who are receiving some kind of government assistance are uh, purchasing uh, any kind of drug at all, be it alcohol, cigarettes, even. Um, anything that they don't see as, as completely necessary for day to day living. How would you address uh, people working in social services who feel that a public acceptance of marijuana is, is uh, compatible with a program that is designed to give you only what you need by the you can't? Uh, I mean, they, they, you know, if they can afford to pay, it's watching you. Oh, yeah. If you start to know something, you know, I'm going to do it. And people lose lots of civil privileges because of marijuana. 